joke about this relationship that uh, Micah and, and John Stones have, this great affection between the two, which is lovely to see, but is he I'm deserving? I'm jealous. I thought, <laughs> I thought there were two of us in this room. <laughs> Roy, any words of celebration for Rangers? Uh, for Rangers, no. Listen, it's been obviously a tough year for Celtic, but they'll bounce back next year like all great clubs do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's an average team, no, or an average squad. It's full of internationals. I think there's a lot of quality in this team. I don't think they're playing to their maximum. I'm not sure what... I agree with Graham there with Josie doesn't know his best team. But if you look at that back four, you know, Dyer doesn't play today. He plays for England. Sanchez, Colombia. Aldevira plays player, for the number one Jamie. team in the world. That doesn't make you a good player. That, Sorry? Playing for your country doesn't make you a, a, no, no, a well, top you're player. There's a lot of if, if you can trap the ball, know, you will play for your country players, these days. <laughs> Doesn't make you a top player because you're well, international. I don't know about that, but I think you're talking. About, but I'm talking about this Dyer, squad, Roy. Dyer's I think they've got better players than you're giving credit Dyer's for. Dyer's been giving goals away every week. Yeah. Last week he gave yeah, a goal he away. Yeah, he has. He's been chopping and changing. Yeah, I agree with that. But he's been chopping and changing, playing with a different player every week. That doesn't help. I don't mean that Jose knows his best team, but I don't think you can turn around and say this isn't a strong squad. It's full of internationals. There's internationals in every department. But being department. An international doesn't he make you a good team. Right backs. Don't, Jamie, still good players. Well, they play for good countries, though, Roy. They play, what you're saying, these aren't good players, then? You said Aldevaro plays for Belgium, he's not a good player. He's not bad. Yeah, would he get any of the top teams? Would he get any of the top teams in England? Yeah, well, he would. Man United wouldn't take him. Man United, your, Man City your, your old team wouldn't sign him a few I'm years ago. I'm not even sure Leicester would take him. Jamie, just Man hold United. a second. Roy, do you think this Spurs team, I then, think is, he's a is where it, it should you're talking be about there. there, Roy. Get in your Man United team right now. I, I think would, keep, keep getting Man United's team. They, they keep looking at the Spurs team. I, I think Spurs were better two or three years ago with the Trippiers and the uh, Ericsons when Ali had the hunger. But this Spurs thing, yeah. Sp Spurs are good on their day, yeah, like, like lots of teams. And Jamie makes the point there going, they've got a lot of international players. If you trap the ball, now you're going to play for your country. Everybody plays for their country. If you don't play for your country, no, you're, you are a well, bad so player. Yeah. So that doesn't guarantee no, that's anything. Not, that's not what I'm saying, Roy. Which, Jamie, yeah, which out of these lads would that's get in? Said, which, which, which out of this Tottenham team would get in Liverpool, Man City team, Chelsea team? You wouldn't touch any of them. Son what, and Kane. Three, you wouldn't touch them? Who? Son and Kane. What, yeah, I'd take heard? them too. Yeah, yeah I'd take them too. Like midfield? outstanding. But the rest of them, you wouldn't okay. touch them. See, I think the bigger picture. You play out of Euros, a better centre back. He'd get in Man United's team as a centre back right now. I think he would. Yeah. I think the goalkeeper's not good enough. I'll agree with you there. I don't think he does well enough. I think the, right, the two right backs have signed. No, I don't trust Aurier and I don't trust uh, Doherty. He hasn't done well enough, but he plays in a back three. I think the back four isn't good enough. But I'll tell you what, Reggion is as good a left back as there is in the country. Yeah. So I think you've got that one wrong. I think he's a, he's a class player. That's I why Real Madrid let him go. Not got any That's why, Real Ma why, why do you think Real Madrid let him what, go? He's not, does that matter? Oh, because Real Madrid let him go. That doesn't make him a good player. Yeah, it's but how much did they let him go for? Country, not a good player, how much did they let him go it's for? It's not as if they paid 60, Sorry, 70 million. They might be able to buy him back, actually. Bring, so you're yeah. saying, no. have you, they bring you Dardy, they bring Dardy, Dardy in. Now, Dardy, he's a Dardy's, fantastic left Dardy's back. Playing, Dardy's playing for Wolves, who are, the last year have done well and they're expecting to compete. They sell him to Spurs for 15 million Dardy. Does anyone really think Dardy's going to make yeah. Spurs a top four team? No, Dardy, really? Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. What about the left back then? So you're saying Reggion's not a good player now? Is that what he you're is, saying? No, he's you a good player. You can't see a lot of Spurs. He is a good player. No, he's a good player. Just take, just take a breath, Jamie. Very good. Well, I think Jamie would agree with you, Jimmy, that they are underachieving. I'm trying to work out what you're saying, Roy, is that they are where they should be, Spurs, in ninth place. I, I expect them to win today, and I expect them to be in the top seven or eight, but this idea that Spurs automatically should be in top four, if you analyse the group of players they've got, and people say, well, he's chopping and, cha he's chopping and changing for a reason, because he can't trust them. They played West Ham last week. We're talking about Bale. Bale came on and made a difference. What did he do? He put a corner in. He's, he's coming to do big things. For, he's coming to Spurs to get him in the top four. He can't get the starting 11 because, whatever we said, Marino's walking with these players day in, day out. And your eyes don't lie to you. And we're talking about Deli Alli. We're, we're sick of talking about Deli Alli. What do you think's going to happen with this kid? We're we'll looking at his stats from two or three years ago. He's, he's lost the hunger, he's lost the eye of the tiger. He's not going to get Tottenham back to the top four. And we have the same conversations every week. We look at the goalkeeper. OK, he's a French international. Yeah, he's part of a brilliant international team. Doesn't make, that doesn't mean to say he's brilliant. The full-backs, they've got about three right-backs at, uh, at Spurs. You wouldn't touch any of them. You would, I'm on about top four. Spurs could turn on today and win two or three nil, and afterwards we'd be all praising them. But this idea that Spurs should automatically be top four, and because Mourinho is a brilliant coach... 
Marina knows the game. He knows the game better than bloody... Can I- After the brilliant start that Bruno Fernandes gave them from the penalty spot. Roy Keane, um, how impressive were United across not just the, the start, but the, the entire 90 minutes? Yeah, uh, again, you could always say a, a perfect performance. They had a, they had a great start, obviously. and uh, But it was... This was a good game for Man United today. Obviously, people have been criticising them recently, but the form, they've been doing OK. Obviously, for Man United, you yeah, always expect more. But today, you knew the counter-attack would have sued them down to the ground. And obviously, they had a dream start after a minute, a goal up. See what happened. City would have had to come at them a bit more. And Ali wouldn't have even dreamt of this this morning to be, what, to get a penalty after 30-odd seconds, particularly when Man City are in control. Basically, it's a set piece, it's a throw-in. You're thinking... But even City here, you're thinking, listen, concentration levels, start quickly. Even here, United are going to be obviously on the front foot. Nothing wrong with th- throwing it down the line. But as soon as they throw into midfield here, you look at United, like a pack of animals here, hungry animals. Great start for Man United. I bet you they couldn't believe their luck. Well, we spoke, we spoke before the game about the, they, are, they are making a lot of excuses. To me, they've been bad champions. And I just don't mean today, you can lose a game of football, but... I can't figure this group out again. I'm looking at them and uh, even the game during the weekends, Brighton, Brighton were comfortable during the game. You can be beaten in the game, there's a way to get beaten. But I don't see that. I think maybe they've all believed the hype over the last year or two. And uh, we spoke about there'd be some sort of drop off or. But they're playing for a big team in Liverpool. It's as if they won the league last year. They've all got a bit carried away and they've all believed their own hype as if they're going to be teams. But in my mindset, when if you can, when you won a league title, your next challenge was always can we do it again? I never got the impression from this group, from even their interviews from their manager last year when they won it, were saying, what's the next step for Liverpool? No, it was almost, let's enjoy this. Obviously, it was a long wait from 30 years, but I never heard kind of any of the players come out and going, well, we want to do it again. That's the key. They're not talking about trying to get in the top four from, from winning the league last year to all of a sudden being going, well, the top four now is, is where our, our targets are. But bad champions. Yeah, I think they've been bad. Yeah, so fair to Having lost Virgil van Dijk early in this season, having lost Joe Gomez and Matip, Diogo Jota along the way. Talking about Liverpool, there are people keep telling me Liverpool's a great club and a huge club. If it's a huge club, you have to deal with setbacks. That, is that not part of the game? If everyone had all their players fit all the time, it'd be fantastic. If you want to look at Man City for a moment, the, with the run they've been on, you could say they're missing two of their best players. But they've come to Liverpool today. And Liverpool had a strong team out today. I know the two and a halves are missing, but they still had their best attacking players on the pitch. They still had their best goalkeeper available. They still have international players in midfield. And after the game, we're talking about, I think Jurgen Klopp said there, maybe the goalkeeper's feet was cold. <laughs> you know, no, that's a new one. I know it was, was tongue-in-cheek a little bit, but uh, it's excuses after excuses. Uh, Jurgen Klopp said the other day about Man City had a break because of the virus when their game was called off against Man City. I think they missed two days training. It just goes on and on and on. You, you, you want a reaction from uh, from you said, a reaction from Liverpool's performance the other night against Brighton it was really poor. A few weeks ago, it was against Burnley, or Man United. They got to Man United in the FA Cup to concede three early in the season. It was seven against Aston Villa. We keep saying that was with oh, well, Van this Dijk. is a one-off. That was with Van Dijk. That seven. was with Van Dijk oh, against Aston Villa. Then. You could say this is a one-off. It's a freak season. It's Corona. It's the... just get on with it. Perform like champions. You Liverpool Football Club. Well, keep performing like that. It'll be another 30 years before you win the league title. Trust me. So, it's, it's sad to see some, some stuff the people saying about the team, about my teammates, about me. But honestly, uh, if the people want to complain about we don't score in the big games, we always draw, I prefer... They can, they can say it's Bruno not play well. I, it, for me, it's OK. I can have that, that pressure on my back. And, and I'm sure in, in some moment I will score, I will assist and I will, I will perform and I will help my teammates to win the games. Well, I've no idea who these ex-players are that he's, that he's talking about. Gary Neville, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> what do you make of that, Roy? He's come out fighting. Fighting? It was bizarre. A lot of nonsense there, wasn't it? Lot, talking about a lot of stats. Just get on with, get on with being a footballer and... Um, he said, he talks about ex-players and pundits. I don't know why these players worry about pundits' opinion. Just get on with it. Just did, you, did you ever think about it or listen to what people said? When I was a player? Mm. Not really, no. I feel like drowning my, my <laughs> sorrows in a sports bar, to be honest. Uh, they, they, they will bounce back. I, I think the run they've been on has obviously been a great run. 
I think it's just hurt today, and it hurts me sitting here because it's it's Man United. And but you right, said you were so relaxed yeah, earlier but, but, when we but, asked but, you about yeah, this. I know, I know. Spoke too soon, didn't I? And fair play to Man United. They really played well. And, and they played, the tactics were spot on, even with possession wise. But look, they've, they've lost a the game. It's not the end of the world. But it's they've the got, local rivals. Is that what really hurts? That's what hurts. It's a local rival call. It, hurt, it hurts me here now. But you know, you never want to lose to United. But I've got to give them credit because they were the better team. But you were team cocky before on, the game, Mickey, weren't you? I, I, wasn't, I wasn't cocky. I was no, just. You were, you were, man. People have been complaining the last few months about Man United getting too many penalties. What happens? I think, I think Graham has won. Yeah. <laughs> Klopp has been another one. He's complained about the penalties I think United are getting. But we always said United are they're getting into penalty areas a lot more. Not opposition, they got people dribbling at people, so they're likely to get more penalties. You can put my name with it as well. And Jimmy, Jimmy's been complaining about it. I'm surrounded here. Um, but I think all he, all he feels was a penalty and we, we all felt at half time. <laughs> that was a penalty. Man, you have had more penalties. I've had 35 in the last. Go back to the start. Should have of had one last season. Today. Go back to the start of last season to today. So a season and a half. They've had 35 penalties. That's more than any other team in any of the big leagues. Does that in mean Europe. they shouldn't get penalties? No. Yeah. yeah. Of course, you get a penalty when it's when it's deserved. But all he comes across there is it's like categorical. It's like it's impossible. It was a definite penalty. <laughs> no, it wasn't. You yeah, but the Chelsea manager penalty. said the same. He said it wasn't a penalty. See, how, you know, the, ma- the, the manager's going to come up and fight the wrong corners. See, how daft it we're talking about penalties. Is this distraction uh, this is, stuff? Exactly. It is a bit of distraction. We're talking about a penalty. Whether you think it was or wasn't, we're talking about two of the best teams in English football coming together today and none of the special players turned up. It was a fascinating interview. He had a lot to say for himself. What did you take away from that, Roy? Um, well, I didn't learn anything new from it, really. You know what he was saying. I think, I think we've all discussed many times over the last few years, Paul Pogba's a talented player. Absolutely. He's not getting away from that. But I still feel he hasn't done enough at Man United. He's obviously mentioned there. He's obviously fell out with Marino. That was a big problem at the club. But even the last few months, we're saying how oh, he's been a big influence. I, I wouldn't agree with that. I think he's playing OK and he's, he's a good player. But I still look in some of the big crunch games United have had this year. He's not turned up. Obviously, not just his fault, but they lost at Leicester, which was a big cup game for him. The Man City at home didn't perform that night. So I, I think when Man United saw, signed Paul Pogba, it wasn't to be playing in the Europa League or to be winning the League Cup. So I think Paul needs a bit of a reminder why he's playing for Manchester United. He, you know, they paid big, big transfer fee, big wages for the likes of him, for Man United to be competing, winning league titles in Champions League. Even this year, the Champions League, United got in a great position and they blew it. Mm. And Paul, Paul Pogba was part of that problem because they've not got over the line in the big games. And it, it, we say he's a big character and a big player. And OK, he's done brilliant with France and stuff like this, but he's not done it for me on a consistent basis at Manchester United. Is that, is that fair, Roy, when they're going through a transitional period, would you say? Well, I'm, I'm sick of hearing that word, Mick. But, that, but that's where, unfortunately, Man United you can say that are, about, you can say that are right now. now. You can say that now. Every time when a club is struggling, they use that word. Every club, near the top or near the bottom, are oh, there just lots of changes. We've been discussing about Arsenal. Man United have had a settled group this year. I think they've just, again, still question marks over this group. And Paul Pogba, you know, I, I, the most important thing, I think Ollie likes him and Ollie likes him as a player and obviously a personality. 
and that's why you're thinking he's got a year left in his contract. Is you know it's going to be a big summer. What United, what Man United do with him? I, I think he's world class. I, I think he he comes with the tag of being a little bit out there because of the social media sort of thing, and that's the modern day player. But they're a better team with him in it. I think he's got a year left at the end of the of the season. I'd be looking to tie him down as soon as possible. I think it's helped the fact that Fernandez has, has come into his game and he's took the pressure away from him just a little bit. I think they're still trying to find his best position. Against Spurs, he started on the left and then came to the right. Ended up in all sorts of positions. When it was at Juventus when I played against him, he was playing like a left and a diamond. And genuinely, he's one of the best players I've played against. It, it, it frustrates me. I, I, I agree with that, Roy. He's he frustrating. But I believe if, if Man United was to invest in the right players at the right times, Man United can be a force and there'll be a better yeah, I'm team not, yeah, with, not, with him I'm, in yeah, it. I, listen, again, we'd be sitting here all day. He's a talented player. Well, does he make them a better team? I think he does contribute to the team. There's no getting away from it. But if you're talking about world class, I think the world class players make the players around him better. I don't think he does that. I don't think he has that effect on Man United. We're talking about these crunch games that Man United have spoke about. And I don't necessarily mean today, but the Leicester, qualifying the FA Cup, Man United, we can expect Man United to be competing at this level. Uh, Man City home the League Cup. I'm looking at him going, even when things aren't going well, does he dig his team out of it? Does he get everybody going? Does he produce? I, I, t to me, the answer is still no. Would you be fighting to keep him then with a year to, to go on his contract? Well, yeah, he's a talent because obviously with the year left in his contract, there's a business side to it. Of course, they'd want to get him tied up. They certainly won't want him leaving on a free next year. So it's an important summer coming up to Oli. If they get over the line in the Europa League and he's happy with Oli, yeah, I think a deal could be done. But obviously he's got an agent. He might be looking at, listen, he will have other options. There's no getting away from that because there's a shortage of talented players out there. And he is talented, but do I think, do I sit here and think, well, if Pog was at Man United, he will get Man United back to winning league titles? The answer is no, because I don't see him. I don't see him making other players better. I mean, that's, I think that's what the brilliant players do, and I've been fortunate enough to play with brilliant players. I think he's a talented boy, but do I see him as that type of character that will drag Man United along when they're up against it? Mm. And the evidence suggests, in his few years at Man United, he hasn't been able to do that. And you can see that the lower tier at Old Trafford has been dedicated now to an anti-racism message as well. And maybe that might work in Manchester United's favour. There have been suggestions. They've been struggling to spot each other at home in the red kit because there's been red banners in that area previously. What do you think about that, Roy? <laughs> Is it the grey kits again? <laughs> I think it's affected Fred more than anybody else. <laughs> Poor Fred. <laughs> Typical United making excuses, eh? I wish they'd done it earlier in the season when they were having read problems. But yeah, it does It does affect players, certainly, when you're passing the ball quickly. Oh, oh, oh you actually say it affects players? Well, I played midfield, Mika, and obviously <laughs> things happen pretty quickly in the air. It's just common sense. If you've got the colour in the background, it does affect them, of course. Why do you think they've changed it? I mean, you know, look at the fall from grace, the Premier League, Champions League, and now he's moaning about banners. I'm not moaning about it. <laughs> Common sense. <laughs> fall from grace. Are you going to be banning fans turning up in home shirts next? What, what, what are you going to be doing? <laughs> <laughs> fall from grace. What happens if Manchester United win and it's eight points, six games to go? Just gives City something to think about, doesn't it? No, I think um, early on in the season... I, I said I was critical of, of Man United in the way they approach games, but with the the attack, the good, I, I didn't think they'd, you know, outplay Man City or, or win the title. I didn't think they had enough for that, and I still believe that. But if they win today, it's just you know you just get that, that <laughs> the nerves start to to set in, and there's a lot of games to play, especially they're in Europe. Man City in the Champions League as well so exciting weeks ahead Dave <laughs> what you would say about this United team and again last week the first half against Spurs not great but when they when they turn it on or they're in the, the zone they do look they, they can score scoring looks easy to them where, when they're in that mood particularly we saw the second half last week so that's that's a big strength for Man United and they've also gotten a good habit of winning football matches what did you think was missing from Manchester United tonight Roy? Um you know, Ollie looks a bit shell shocked there. I think it's been a tough few days. You know, the performance tonight, nowhere near good enough. On the back of the Leicester result, when you start playing your squad players you think are good enough to get Man United back to winning league titles, absolutely no way. I think all United's shortcomings have been shown up in the last couple of days. And um, tonight, just not enough quality. Ollie's mentioned they're giving such bad goals away. 
But the other worry again, I, I think Liverpool could have scored six or seven. We praise United the last few months, but this this squad is so short of competing. I think with Man City to win the title. And it's just been, all their shortcomings have been shown up the last few days. And that's why I think Ollie found it really difficult to even speak to. I, I, I think he's shell-shocked from the four goals tonight and even the poor performance the other night against Leicester. But is that schedule not a factor, Roy? Well, let's get, well I think when you're playing for a big club, you have, to, you have to accept that. You're going to play a lot of games. You're going to be playing two or three games a week. But he made changes the other night. It's not as if he's asked players to play two games in 48 hours. But when the, the performance against Leicester... You know, they'd one shot and target in 90 minutes. And these are the players who are your backup players, your squad players. But the squad players have shown to be to be short, particularly if you compare them with Man City. And that's who you have to compare them about because that's who you're competing against. But I think Man City are so far ahead of this this United squad, it's scary. And I think Ali will reflect the last few days and think, we need three or four big players to come into this club in the summer. Three or four, at least. And of course, we all know that's easier said than done. The recruitment's got to be right. He's got to be given money to spend. I just look at the performance tonight of the two midfielders. Mac Tomlin is a good, honest player. They got Fred. As long as them two players are playing in midfield for Manchester United, they will not be winning any big trophies. OK, they've got the Europa League fine in a few weeks. That's only, they're only not fine because they, they come up short in the Champions League. Now, let's not be kidded on by that either. I, I'm really... The last few days of... I, I can't believe how, how short Man United are. And Ollie mentioned it again tonight about they're chasing the game, they need a goal. They bring Matic on instead of Van der Beek. You know, it's not good enough. Look, we, we, it's embarrassing. I was embarrassed for us today. Does, does Harry Kane look fit? The question is as simple as that. No, he, do, he does look leggy. You know, whatever about his, his general play, you look, he doesn't look up to speed. He looks, he's on his heels all the time. And if England really want to compete in this competition, you need your star men to perform. We've seen Lukaku turn up De Bruyne yesterday. Ronaldo... They need Kane at his best, and I'm glad Garrett took him off because there's this talk about he's undroppable, he's the star, he's the main man. If he's not performing, you get him off. Rashford gave him a little bit more energy, but still not enough. His goal got you where, where you got to. Harry Kane not performing, I mean, I, I don't, I think it's a major problem for you. Apart from Harry Kane, I don't see that team. Football ain't coming home with that team, I can tell you. And, <laughs> not that, not the way they're playing. You mentioned the last World Cup. One of the big strengths for England at the time was the set pieces. The delivery tonight, nowhere near good enough. And, and that sometimes can get you out of jail. OK, Stones at the head up, but general wide free kicks, corner kicks. How many times did they hit the first man? Nowhere near good enough. Talk about the depth that England have got. What are your reflections on the Republic and the Luxembourg game? Oh, it was a difficult, tough night last night. I have to say, I think Ireland is, must be rock bottom now for the, for the group of players. Um, real, real lack of quality. You know, a lot of the players, again, for Ireland now playing in the championship level. I think the big concern is when, you, when your best player, which is Seamus Coleman, is a full-back, it's not a good sign. So... Um, yeah, and, and tough days ahead. Where does that leave Stephen Kenny? In terms of the approach, as, uh, if nothing else, in terms of his tactical approach? Well, obviously, he's got his ways. He's trying to play more, uh, I suppose, pa pa certainly more, um, more possession. He's trying to get through the, play through the team. But the stats are scary, really, for Ireland. The, the lack of goals, lack of goal scores. But I think as much as um, it's difficult for Stephen Kenny, it's, it's been tough going for him. I always go back to when I, I analyse all the Irish players nearly every weekend and, and none of them are doing too much at club level. They're, they're doing okay and they're, they're honest, but a lot of them are playing in the, in the championship. And when you turn up for Ireland and the manager's got them for three or four days, it's very, very difficult. And then when the manager's trying to have, to have this style of play, where it's possession, 
it's very, very difficult, especially if the players aren't up to it. As you said, in sharp contrast to the fact that a lot of the England players now are getting Champions League experience. That just shows the gap, doesn't it? Yeah, and I go back to it again. The, the best player in Ireland I've got by far is Seamus Coleman. And Seamus is playing for a brilliant club at Everton. But Everton don't play European football. They don't really challenge for trophies. So it's, it's a long way back for Ireland. Every team has difficult spells. You mentioned the teams you played in, which were brilliant. Um, and... It's a, it's a tough interview when you've been obviously beaten heavily and I know he's trying to look at the positives. He's talking about players doing well in the second half but the game was over. He said they started the game well the first 10 minutes. You know, obviously the game's 90 minutes long. Um, there's no point in looking back. You can't talk about what happened the last year or two. It's a new team. I think what will probably frustrate him when, when he looks back on the game today and obviously the, the, the little run they've been on and he'll sit there with his staff and he'll analyse it and it, and he'd probably be looking at it for the money they've spent. They don't look any stronger than they were last season. And I know lads are getting up to speed. I agree with that. They're coming to a new league, new language. Even with the COVID stuff, no supporters. It's a big ask. And then like today, you play a really good team like Man City. But I, the, the bit, I, I always scratch my head up when I'm watching a game of football and you're seeing teams having an off day. Frank said himself, he'll have, he'll have a look at himself. Is when players don't, don't run back or put a tackle in, Obviously, we highlighted the goal there, even with Canty, an experienced international player, making a mistake for the third goal, not just hitting the ball short and then obviously in on your goal. Players not sprinting back. I, I really don't get that. I've been, I've been in football a long time and people try and analyse that and they go, well, you know, what about players running? That should be in your, your instinct as a human being and a footballer. So I think Frank will be concerned and he's not going to throw his players under the bus tonight because he's, he's probably done that the last few weeks. He's been really critical. Today he's probably thinking, oh, I need to try and keep him on side if I can. But he must be concerned with what he saw today. He has to be. With the little run they're on, you could say, yeah, it's a difficult little spell they've been and they've slipped up. But today it was your thinking with the attacking players. and well, I, was, I, thought, I thought Chelsea would, would put on a good performance. But there was a lack of energy. Lack of, again, when I see... If you're, when you're playing a game and you're losing 3-0 you're not putting any tackles in on anybody that's a huge concern for me he's on about De Bruyne of finding space players trying to figure it out he's got senior players out there he's got lads who've won the World Cup he's brought in centre-half Silva he's an experienced player Canty's an experienced player how they didn't sort it out or start putting tackles in or pulling people in when they were just under pressure particularly 15-20 minutes into the first half you're going listen <laughs> You kind of smell danger. You find when De Bruyne had the chance, you're thinking, listen, City are getting a foothold in the game. Let's just sit in for a time being. No problem with that. That would be the big concern for me. He did mention that, didn't he? That, that ability to solve problems on the pitch. But what about Roy's bigger point there, that perhaps they're not even any further forward, having spent all this money? No, I, I agree with Roy and I agree with, with Graham what, what they're saying. But I said it with Arsenal uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, they, they do need time to, to, to settle in. You can't expect them to be all guns blazing. We said the... How much time? Today, a season? Well, well yeah, they, they, need at they need at least a season, Dave. We, we said the first time Ziyech and, and, and Pulisic have, have, have started together. Uh, Havertz as well is, is, is not played. And I think it's difficult. When, you, when you're at a team that's got the pressure on Frank Lampard, we all, we all know he overachieved last season with the players, yeah, but... These players need time to come into a, a, a difficult league. Man, Man City have spent money. They've had time to, to build their team. And they've been up and down recently. But they got it right today. Chelsea got beat by the better team today. But that, that can change. Um, you know, it's not always as bad as you think. They just got beat by a better team today. Yeah, there's been times when Man City have had bad games. Look at the, the, the Leicester game. You know what I mean? It happens in football, but they need to get it right well, quick we, we just have, because of the amount of money that they have spent. The big difference had. between Chelsea and all the other clubs, Chelsea don't give managers time. We're talking about Frank. and it's, We had Oli a couple of, uh, last year. We've heard of other managers. Obviously Klopp, going Arteta, back to Klopp. a couple of weeks ago. Sorry? Arteta, we were talking yeah, about of course, a couple of weeks and ago. And these managers under pressure. But Chelsea, it's in their, their DNA and their history. They don't give managers time.
I, I burst onto the scene, didn't I? And Did you burst onto the scene? Burst? Do you not remember <laughs> my head against the, on Villa? Do you not remember that? No. What if you defenders burst onto? Oh, the burst. <laughs> well, hold on. I played for England at 18. Youngest ever defender to play for England. Yeah. I would say that's bursting onto the scene. I used to shave the legs when I when I was playing anyway for strappings, but only to about shin height. You know. He's gone the full, he's got the full whatever the word is, yeah. Okay. We've got to wrap this up, unfortunately. We've been way over time. We're what about give Matty Taylor story? Is it worth it, Roy? Well, Matty about... Taylor? <laughs> th- let me do that Matty Taylor story. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Set me up for a fall, yeah. <laughs> it probably won't good. be as funny here as it was on the flight this morning. Um, up at Sunderland, blah, blah, blah. Trying to get players up to Sunderland, always difficult. Their wives didn't want to go up there because they want to go shopping. They did it. Eventually get Matty Taylor up. He was leaving, I think, Portsmouth. And he, he had an opportunity, I think, to go to Sunderland or Bolton. So I met him at the, uh, the stadium, up at the boardroom. Gave him all the, the talk for about an hour or two. He said, I've got a lot to think about. It's a big decision. I said, of course, you take your time. Huge decision. I'll walk you down to the car park. As we walked down, he says, listen, Roy, huge decision. Thanks for the chat. He says, yeah, you take your time. Big decision. I understand for your family. No problem. Bolton, Sunderland to Bolton is no comparison, but listen, Bolton, we're not a bad team at the time. I see him walking to his car. He says, listen, brilliant. Thanks for coming up. I'm literally, he turned his back. I got a text. <laughs> text? There's not many people text me. So I says, uh, <laughs> hi, Roy, it's Maddie Taylor. So, all right. <laughs> Got, I've got my phone. I think it was a Blackberry at the time they were in, and I went, uh, <laughs> I can see him getting in his car. <laughs> <laughs> I've, uh, I've decided to go to Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waving, I'm going out the car. <laughs> And you can see that the lower tier at Old Trafford has been dedicated now to an anti-racism message as well. And maybe that might work in Manchester United's favour. There have been suggestions. They've been struggling to spot each other at home in the red kit because there's been red banners in that area previously. What do you think about that, Roy? (laughs) Is it the grey kits again? (laughs) I think it's affected Fred more than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Fred. <laughs> Typical United making excuses, eh? I wish they'd done it earlier in the season when they were having real problems. But yeah, it does It does affect players, certainly, when you're passing the ball quickly. Oh, oh you actually say it affects players? Well, I played midfield, Mika, and obviously <laughs> things happen pretty quickly in the air. It's, it's just common sense. If you've got the colour in the background, it does affect them, of course. Why do you think they've changed it? I, I mean, you know, look at the fall from grace, the Premier League. Champions League and now he's moaning about banners I'm not moaning about it <laughs> common sense <laughs> fall for uh, grace are you going to be banning fans turning up in home shirts next what, what, what are you, you going to be doing <laughs> Ball from grace what happens if Manchester United win and it's eight points six games to go just gives City something to think about doesn't it no I think um, early on in the season I I, I said I was critical of, of Man United in the way they approach games but with the the attack, the good, I, I didn't think they'd, you know, outplay Man City or, or win the title. I didn't think they had enough for that, and I still believe that. But if they win today, it's just the, you know you just get that, that <laughs> the nerve start to to set in, and there's a lot of games to play, especially they're in Europe. Man City in the, the Champions League as well, so exciting weeks ahead, Dave. <laughs> what you would say about this United team? And again, last week, the first half against Spurs, not great. But when they when they turn it on or they're in the, the zone. 
they do look they, they can score scoring looks easy to them where when they're in that mood particularly we saw the second half last week so that's that's a big strength for Man United and they've also gotten a good habit of winning football matches do you not think Dean Smith would have mentioned this to the defenders about Man United young players shooting he's got to go two yards he's made the first mistake and that's why teams get relegated when your experienced players cannot do the basics now I'm scratching my head I can't understand why he can't go two yards and that's why Pepe Reina is he's like a madman shouting at him and Dean Smith you've got John Terry in the dressing room why he doesn't go to two yards I can't understand I no sympathy for Aston Villa tonight I before the game I thought listen bit of energy big club I had a short time there brilliant people there but when you have defenders defending like that you deserve everything you get is that three work then for you as a, as a three with with Beckham anything better than Ian Wright's done <laughs> <laughs> we're in for a great final <laughs> boy did you enjoy that um, not really no <laughs> 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 yes, you did. <laughs> you know, you're always thinking about the players and the dressing yes, room, all no. this kind of bit of nonsense, but it is what it is. The City, United have slipped to 14th, only one point clear of the relegation zone. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the hugging that Roy's not happy with. <laughs> Roy, Roy, what is it that's causing you effect nah, in, yeah, in this whole thing? player. You, you, you're going to war. You know, hugging and kissing. Don't even look at the opposition. You're going to battle against them. Has uh, the game uh, changed? No, the game hasn't changed that much. The players have changed. The players have changed. You, you're going to war against these players. Now. They're hugging each other. Forget that. You can chat to them after the game. Well, don't even chat to them after the game. And maybe you swap shirts at half time. Clearly, <laughs> our chances of uh, getting out of this group are gone now. But what can we do against Italy? Oh, we're playing for pride. We're out of shadow of a doubt. You know, the fans are playing purely for them and ourselves, our own pride. You know, they've come and travelled in thousands, and, and you can hear them tonight. Have you ever just, heard an atmosphere like that after a 4 0 defeat? It's, 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 in, it's incredible. You know, our seven or eight minutes to go, and all you can hear is the Ireland fans are losing 3 4 0. It's, 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 it's unbelievable. Well, the lads come to the wicket with the interview, but it's kind of an old trick, isn't it, to just do nothing but praise the opposition and the quality of your own support. Could Ireland have done any more to counter? I think the players and even the supporters, they all have to change their mentality. It's just nonsense from players speaking after the games about how great the supporters are. Listen, the supporters want to see the team do, doing a lot better and not giving daft goals away like that. So, no, listen, I'm, I'm not too happy with all that nonsense again. And praise the supporters for the sake of it. Listen, let's change that attitude towards Ireland support as well listen they want to see the team winning as well let's not kid ourselves I know we're a small country and you listen we're up against it but let's not just go along for the sing song every now and again it was at this moment that he knew he f***ed up oh, oh my god would you characterize him as a coach um excellent coach you know along with a lot of great coaches I worked under at Man United um probably quite defense minded um, I always felt I had a decent relationship, particularly in his first spell at the club, um, his second spell when he came back. Um, for some reason, towards the end of my time there, I, f I found him really disrespectful towards me, so we had a bit of a fallout, you know, he, qu he questioned my loyalty. And um, I told him where to go. <laughs> and one of my big regrets, really, I probably should have ripped his head off. But <laughs> excellent coach, and he's doing an excellent job, has to be said. And I think he'll enjoy tonight's challenge because he's he likes obviously defensive shape and uh, players covering the spaces. Um, and they'll be delighted with the result they had from the first game, of course. <clears throat> well, how did you find him as a coach? And did, did I, uh, I think he's one of the main reasons. No, no, yeah. no, he's one of the main reasons I signed for United because I remember with Monaco when. We beat uh, in the semi-final, um, in the quarter-final, Real Madrid, but the Real Galactico, and I heard them a lot that game. I gave two assists. So from that game, Carlos Queiroz was the manager of uh, Real Madrid, and when I joined United, he was the only one speaking French. So he helped me uh, a lot to adapt myself to Manchester United, because Ferguson. The first word I hear about him is when I had a really bad 45 minutes against Manchester City on my debut. Yeah. And he was like Patrice now sit down and learn the English football so Carlos Carlos has been uh, really helpful for me yeah. on my time in my and did you hear a story or two about Carlos and, and Roy yeah of course I think like Carlos is someone he 
you feel like he, he never smile you know <laughs> he, he never smile his, uh, his training session are perfect and I think even when he left United he was uh, tactically he was not the same so we keep winning the league but tactically we were not the same but as a person yeah he's, he's uh, really difficult I would say yeah. <laughs> I mean understandably you were saying don't talk to me about loyalty if you went to Manchester yeah, that was my, came back again. yeah that was my point when, yeah. he, uh, when, he, when he was brave enough to throw that at me <laughs> considering he'd left as you said to go to Real Madrid and was back yeah. within 10 months with you know his tail between his legs but again take that away a really good coach and uh, I did enjoy walking under him we've been the benchmark for the rest of the, the teams over the last few years but last year you have to give credit Arsenal and Liverpool definitely passed us by and I just think they, they were more hungry than us. You ask any sports people, I suppose boxers, anything, if you slacken off one or two percent, you're found out. I think we were found out last year. The hunger just wasn't there. After winning the triple, I read a few quotes from different players and they said, they said like at the time, oh, I don't care if I never win a trophy again. Oh, it doesn't matter now what happens. And you're thinking, um, well, I've been amazed at the, the commotion that's been that's been going on over the last few days. I think um, from about Henri's handball, yeah, of course he handled it, but I'd focus on why didn't they clear it. I'd be more annoyed with my defenders and my goalkeeper than, than Thierry Henry. How can you leave a ball bounce in the six-yard box? How can you let Thierry Henry get gold side of you? And if the ball bounced in the six-yard box, I'd be saying, where, where the hell is my goalkeeper? But having handled the ball, do you feel the integrity of the game has been damaged? No. No, not one bit. You know, you, you look over the course of the campaign, Ireland had the chances in the two games. They never took it in the first game, they never performed. Um, I heard a few interviews after the games where the manager was speaking about none of the players got booked. Maybe that was a problem. They should have got booked in the first game because we stood off France. In the second half, we had opportunities to score and we didn't take it. But usual Irish FBI re, you know, reaction, we've been robbed, the honesty of the game. It was one of the group matches, I'm sure it was Georgia, where Ireland got a penalty. It was one of the worst decisions I've ever seen from one of their defenders, which changed the whole course of the game. I think, I think Robbie scored a penalty and Ireland went on to win it. I don't remember the FBI after the game saying we should give him a replay. Well, the FAI are asking for the game to be replayed now. What, what Who? John Delaney. He's on about the honesty and tech. I wouldn't take any notice of that man. Really? No. So people, you know, people forget the last time I were in the World Cup, 2002. Okay. People seem to forget what was going on in that World Cup. And that man's on about honesty. I was one of the players. He didn't, he didn't have the courtesy to ring me. He got interviewed and all he said was, I don't know where he is. He's on the island. He's on the island somewhere, I think. I've been involved in Ireland since I was 15 years of age. And that man didn't have the decency even to make a phone call. But he knew where to contact you? He could have phoned me. Of course he could have. Try my hotel room. <laughs> yeah, you can laugh. That was the World Cup. Yes. And he's on with the honesty of the game. Well, what they're saying, saying the game is, was important, so should an exception be made and should it be replayed? Because there was... There was should have cleared it. Was should have cleared it. Should have cleared, cleared, cleared the ball. Yeah. Where was the defender? The ball bunks in the six-yard box. Do you think, though, because of that incident, Roy, it, it maybe ought to hasten people's thinking about whether video technology yeah, ought to be introduced? Well, we've had this, right yeah, we've had this discussion before. Yeah, we all agree with that. Mm. There's no getting away from it. But this idea that Ireland were robbed and they deserve a replay. No, but we've been saying it for the last... Uh, every few months I get asked about it, and we say, yeah, it has to come into the game. Of course, with the money involved, what's at stake? I think the Irish supporters probably deserve better. I think the manager, probably most of the players deserve better. But I'm not sure the FBI deserve better. What goes around comes around. Um, what do you think about the captain of France, Thierry Henry, handling the ball that led to the goal? Well, I think it was his instinct. I think sometimes you, do, you go for the ball, you see your leg out, your hand out, whatever it might be. Would I call him a cheat? No, I wouldn't think so. I think... Did he bend the rules a little bit? Yeah, but we see cheating going on all the time in games. Players dive in. When I'm asked about it, I say, yeah, the game is full of it. But should it be stopped, the cheating? Yeah, of course. Nobody, nobody wants to cheat. <laughs> Which phone is that? That's the second time it's gone off. No idea. That's my phone. Sorry. Why did you turn it off? 
You should notice the second time it's gone off. Why don't no. you put it on silent? No, it's not the second time. Why don't you turn it off? Well, I'll turn that off in a minute. You just got to let it ring. Well, I thought I'd let it ring out. All oh, right, that's, that's good manners. <clears throat> I mean, sh should the game be doing something to Yeah, of course. Like yeah, but me and you aren't going to do it, are we? Me and you aren't going to do it. FIFA are going to do it. Mm. You ask me the same question every few months. Mm. What, we, what me and you are going to do about it? <coughs> drop, them, them. drop them an email. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Drop them an email. Mm. What about the supporters and... Yeah. No, I was going to... Yeah. Thank you, honestly, boy. No problem. I appreciate it. Absolutely no problem. Thank you. Just one more question on that issue, uh, Roy. You mentioned about the defenders should their first instinct should have been to clear the ball. I heard Kevin Kilban saying about playing to the whistle, and that's the thing that's been brought to you. Exactly. Day one. But it's just a usual reaction. Ex-players getting involved, obviously getting a few bob for their interviews, the media selling newspapers, a replay. Just defend it. If that was my team, I'd go into the dressing room and I wouldn't even mention that ball. I'd just say, why didn't someone put their head in it? Defenders are more focused on players. There's only one ball, just go and head it. Where's my goalkeeper? The ball bunks in the six-yard box from a free kick just inside the halfway line. That's what I'd be asking. Not to do with that ball. I was going to say, it doesn't matter what level you play at, I'm sure you've got those... Listen, coming on, coming on Saturday. of course, at every level, when you're nine, ten years of age, every defender's told, don't let the ball bunks, particularly in your own box, and you play to the final, you play to the whistle. And Ireland had chances anyway. They had chances of Croke Park, didn't take them. They had chances in Paris, and France were there for the taking. France were there for the taking, and Ireland never grabbed it. Usual. Usual stuff. Afraid of that next step. It's about lack of composure and quality. Well, I think he was as guilty as anybody. You know, and he, he needs to step up to the plate. But now he's the captain, there's a bit more responsibility, and I think he's got to do a lot more. I always question certain players, what are they doing off the field? You know, I see, I see Wayne getting involved. I saw him last week, you know, at some wrestling, slapping a wrestler. I'm thinking, why is he getting involved in all that nonsense? It's, you know, there's no benefit to him. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd have a look at that side of it. Which means there's a bit of a plague of moss at the stadium. That's the idiot <laughs> takes on. Rather frightened by that one. Mark Clattenburg, good big night for him, the English referee. Good luck to him. Look how many's on the ground, yeah, Mark? Look at that! Ryan, wow. you said you've played a game, a pre-season game, where you're playing amidst big moths. That's pretty unpleasant. Yeah, it wasn't as many as that, yeah. but they were bigger. I think yeah. one tackled me, actually. When I was <laughs> the wind. Um, but yeah, well, you, uh, you just get on with it. I mean, it's the final, you know, you're not going to let a few moths uh, put you off, hopefully. Yeah, a few moths put you off? No, I wouldn't have thought so. Hopefully it'd be fine by kickoff time. Yeah. We actually talk gigs you open as well. <laughs> 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 hopefully it'd be set Hey, this is off a man. I, yeah, yeah. No, I lent him my golf GTI for a week. He, well, he said a week. Six months later, he's still got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, any chance? Well, it was a full tank when I gave it back. <laughs> what do you want? He was um, quite a character as well, Roy, by all accounts. And um, he told us a little story when he joined us on Monday Night Football about how he tried to win you over. I always remember my first away trip having an argument with Roy Keane. Yeah. <laughs> and I think... What was it about? From then, <laughs> we were watching... <laughs> no, we were watching... Roy was watching the rugby. And the night before, we played Newcastle away. And he went to get his food, so I turned over and put X Factor on and <laughs> hit the remote. <laughs> so he weren't happy about it anyway, so I had an argument, but I think straight away he knew he respected me more for it for Yeah, because you watched that having factor. A, having, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but for having to go back at him and who won that argument? And um, no, it just come to a conclusion and ended, but I think he looked at him and he was he respects the fact that he, I was big enough to have a go back at him. Just wondering, Roy, what was it? Not watching the rugby or X Factor coming out was the biggest problem. <laughs> we certainly didn't have an argument, let me tell you. I um, yeah, I like I like my rugby league, and um, 
<laughs> yeah, I did. Someone did change the channel. Uh, I wasn't happy. And we didn't have an argument about it because the next day I remember I came down for breakfast and uh, and Wayne said to me, oh, um, did you find the controls? And I told them where to go. And that was it, really. So that's an argument. <laughs> God help us. But I certainly didn't didn't respect Wayne because he stood up to me because he wanted to watch the X Factor or whatever he wanted to watch. Um, I had a lot of respect for Wayne anyway because I thought he was a brilliant player. And... Um, I wouldn't say I warmed to the guy. Um, I certainly didn't dislike him. But, you know, lads are on a different wavelength, different banter. And if hiding the controls was that type of banter, then <laughs> <laughs> not for me. I wanted X Factor on, to be fair. <laughs> you wanted grand designs on, Gary. That's what you wanted on, grand designs. <laughs> <laughs> I do I actually remember I actually remember it you, somebody wrote me yesterday and told me about that we were going to play I think I remember you did go up to your room didn't you quite quickly that night after the no I didn't go up quite quickly Gary you did no I went up to the rugby league when you look back we're talking about the pressures of the game and you have people are arguing about X Factor that's what really happens in the dressing room let me tell you or a hotel <laughs> who wants to watch X Factor amazing <laughs> Tell so us about what it's like in the, in the dressing room <clears throat> when you've got young players coming. You're talking about Rooney and, and different types of, of banter and dealing with different people. How is that for you when you were, you know, the late twenties, early thirties at Manchester United, captain, maybe the you know the yeah. main man in that dressing room? You got younger players coming in like Rooney and Ronaldo. No, good point, Jamie. I, I, I the, your dressing room is always changing. Every summer, you know, most summers is it one or two new players coming. The dynamics change. Young players are coming in. And I'll be honest, the dressing room, to, when I was getting to my, um, I suppose towards the end of my career, and I was looking around the dressing rooms and obviously people like Wayne and Rio and Fletcher and O'Shea and all these lads in the dressing room. And things were changing, the dynamics were changing, which I always used to roll with, which I didn't mind. I enjoyed it because it'd give you a new type of energy. And especially if they were good players, you go, listen, they'll help us win trophies. But towards the end, I remember thinking with some of these lads, no, I don't, I, I'm not really getting some of these. I don't get their banter. I don't get their humour. I, I probably very rarely had a conversation with any of them. I was constantly looking at the bigger picture. Were they going to be good players for Man United? And that was the most important thing. So even when I left the club, there was a lot of players. Mm. Uh, Jamie, there was a lot of players I didn't probably actually miss one bit. I just thought, no, they one for me. The, the, the game was changing. I'd look around the dressing room times after training. The amount of players were on their phones. And all that type of thing. But I'm a bit... Uh, old school and a bit grumpy or whatever I don't know but I I, I didn't get it I didn't get even Wayne Rio I, I, I didn't get that banter I didn't get what they stood for sometimes you know that, that was just a personal thing I just thought the game is changing obviously and I've changed with it I, I changed myself since I was a young kid at Forest and going to United and body fats and sports science and being in brilliant dress rooms and dress rooms change sometimes but towards the end at United with this type of players that were coming through I didn't always get them. I have to say, I just thought, personality-wise, they're not for me. But they're obviously they're all very, very good players and I was a professional and I was delighted to play with them. But in terms of having banter with them and having a cup of tea or a coffee or anything like that with them, no, nah, forget it. Now, Ireland's Robbie Keane will be ready to face Germany in their Euro 2016 qualifier on Thursday. He arrived late at training, though, from the United States after the birth of his second son. Very happy event. One reporter asked the assistant manager, Roy Keane, whether Robbie will be ready for the match. Why wouldn't he be? 
Well, his wife just had a baby, and I think that might have delayed his arrival. Yeah, but he didn't have the baby, did he? <laughs> <laughs> Unless he's breastfeeding, he should be alright. I'd like to see them more on the front foot, but I think they'll play exactly as they have done this time tomorrow. England going to be in the semi finals? I don't think so, no. Oh, cheers, Roy. Um, but we all know what. Uh, Competing as if he would rather die of exhaustion than lose, he inspired all around him. I felt as if it were an honour to be associated with this player. Sir Alex Ferguson on Roy Keane versus Juventus. Stuff like that kind of almost insults me. What, what am I supposed to do? Give up? Not cover every blade of grass? Not do my best for my teammates? Not do my best for my club? Uh, to be honest, I, I actually get offended when people throw quotes like that at me as if I'm supposed to be um, honoured by it. It's like praising the postman for delivering your letters, he's supposed to, isn't it? That's his job. My job is trying to win football matches for Man United. I think if I played like some of their defenders did in that game last night, I would consider retiring from football. <laughs> I really would. Uh, shameful. <laughs> the fact is they scored two late goals just obviously covered the cracks a little bit. But again, we can slag Rome off, but you still have to take advantage of that. And Liverpool did and, uh, and punished them, and rightly so. Do you know what, if I was in Garrett's shoes, I wouldn't try and be too clever. I'm, I'm kind of bored of the lads all night, and I did. England have already won the tournament, according to these lads down there. I would just say, keep it simple, just focus on the next game. Try and win the next game. Don't worry about last 16, quarter-final, final, final these guys down there. Try and win the next game of football. And don't try and please everybody, you're on about giving lads from the, the squad a game. Try and win the next game of football. Uh, I think, um, really, I thought it was a shocking result. Really poor performance. Uh, Brendan's talking there about it's a, it's a great achievement. I think what we could look at, I think the key to management nowadays is set your standards really, really low <laughs> and you'll be in the game for a long time. Just, I just thought not acceptable for Celtic. It really isn't. Losing a home town elect. Oh, come on, give me a break. Oh, where do I start? <laughs> no, I think Arsenal are, are a great example on how not to start a game of football. You know, uh, obviously we could talk about being a, being a shambles, but they're so slow out of the blocks, poor attitude. Uh, the manager summed it up, no energy, no desire. You're looking for your, your senior players to lead by example. You know, I always think when Wilshire's is your captain, to me, probably the most overrated player on the planet. And they got lucky with the result at the end of it. But if you start the game slowly, no matter how good you are, it's hard to get going. You it's not like a light switch. You can't just switch it on and off. Yeah, but before the game and yesterday and today, we're talking about England. The whole talk about the final, you know, the final. France going to play. Yeah, and I know May made a point a few weeks ago, a bit tongue in cheek with the players, but you're going, you have to focus just on one game. And everyone was talking about the final. What are you talking the about? The football's coming home. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, do your impression. Right. <laughs> We wasn't talking about the final like that. We were just having a laugh with you. The fact is, we were trying to just like, we were happy. You weren't happy for us being happy at that time. But I, I think that we were. I don't mind you being happy, but you, you're like getting carried away. <laughs> and I was right, you were planning the final, where the parades were. No, we were You, you were, no. you were talking about, you no. did a reality check. No, we were. You no, didn't why, did why, should, why should we get excited about it? It was, it was something Yeah, get excited. Get excited, Listen, get excited when they get to the final. No, but the, this was the right, semi-final of the group match. People didn't even expect us to get to the semi-final. Why couldn't we be excited about being in there? Yes. Before, the game, game, before the game, is a before the game, everybody is thinking that we'd be the final. Before the game, about the final. Yeah, but everybody thought that we'd be crazy before the game. Why should we be excited about that? You know how hard it is to get to these big finals, or even get to a World Cup. We're talking about finals. <laughs> final. You know what I'm talking about. Relax yourself. Strong hand, last minute. It doesn't matter if it's the last minute. If this goes into the back of the net, I'll be saying, "Where's my goalkeeper?" And all this hugging players after matches as well. Over the top stuff. My goodness, what's the game coming to? Come on, it's all right. It's ridiculous. Uh, 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 so we're talking about the players and the quality, and we've got to talk about this idiot. It's, an, it's a crazy decision. Crazy. I'm just about to calm down, but hopefully by the end of the game. Ridiculous. We'll get you a cup of tea, <laughs> and all will, all will be good in the second 45. <laughs> been at Real Madrid, he's been at Inter Milan, where they do move matches to help those clubs in European competitions. But to go back to our original point, they don't have the huge huge domestic TV deals that we have. I've never heard so much rubbish in my life. Why do we have to listen to that garbage? It's just utter nonsense what he's talking about. He's manager of Manchester United, one of the biggest clubs on the planet, the squad he's got, the players, and he keeps moaning about fixtures and fatigue. We were just looking at some of the cup draws they've had. They've had a, an easy ride in the cup, some good draws, a lot of home draws. 
and um, the guy's talking absolute nonsense. Never heard so much rubbish in my life. Mm. Is it? Maybe the club's too big for him. He can't deal with all these demands of the matches. What, what, what matches? Cup competitions. They played a. Man United reserves could have won that game tonight. No, I'm sick to death of him. The, I suppose the, the worry for me, I remember last year when United won, the, the manager was talking about with his players and staff that they'd won three trophies last year. My goodness, the manager was including the Charity Shield as a major trophy. <laughs> My God, no, you're in trouble. Irish honesty as blunt as a ceremonial sword. Give us a smile, Roy. He looks about as amazed at the rest of us as what we've just seen. Sort of shocked. That interview was just like the performance, flat. No. Well, I mean, what do you want him to do? Just fall at Gabriel's feet crying? I mean, he's... Well, say something... Say a bit more. A bit more urgency in his, even his interview. That just reflected United's performance tonight. Flat, no urgency. And they keep saying, oh, well, you know, next game, next... For some of them, there won't be another game for them. That's the reality for it. Liverpool all the hard stuff really well in terms of creating chances, pace, power, bit of quality going forward. That is the easiest part of football, yet Liverpool can't seem to do it. And yeah. that's why... They catch and that's going to handicap them if they want to win the league or if they go oh, deep in the Champions League. Win the league and Champions League. Oh, forget it. For Liverpool, oh, forget about it. I think they have enough to get through the, groups, the, uh, the group. But later, later on in the stages against the Real Madrid and all these boys, they'd be laughing at Liverpool. Well, well as the manager, obviously, Gareth's entitled to name the team when he likes. I played under two great managers, Brian Clough and Alex Ferguson, and they generally would name the team an hour or two before kickoff. That never, that never bothered me. No, what helped me, I probably always knew I was going to be starting. The lads might maybe give you a better answer <laughs> on that, but it never bothered me in the least. No. They'll want to sort that out as, <laughs> as quickly as possible. Every time you think it's going to be sorted out, there's another, there's another hitch in the story. It'll go on and on and on until Costa gets what he wants. That's how it'll yeah, work. Yeah, they're, they're better off without him. I, I think the guy's obviously big trouble. I know he done well for him, but he looks to me a bit of a balloon. Get rid of him and, and have players at your club who want to be there. Yeah, a balloon, yeah. It's, a balloon. <laughs> it's hard to figure out Liverpool at the moment. I think it's hard to get excited about them. To me, they're going nowhere fast. Um, Again, they're neat and tidy, but defensively, you know, come the end of the season when the prizes are being given out, Liverpool will be nowhere near it because, like Lee just said, at the back, you know, question marks over the goalkeeper, you know, I, there's not too much to say about Liverpool. I think if Liverpool were playing out, out my back garden, I wouldn't watch them. They just, you got a big back garden. It's pretty big, yeah. They're just, <laughs> to me, just, they're just drifting, and drifting nowhere. Do, do you do you look at what's going on defensively and with the goalkeeper? And, and managers are easily characterised as incredibly stubborn. And the more they're told something, you know, with your old manager at Arsenal, the more they they refuse to do that. Do you feel that about Jurgen Klopp? The Liverpool... more people say you've got a problem with your goalkeeper, you've got to got a problem with your back four. He doesn't do anything about it. Yeah, but it's easier said than done about getting defensive players in because you know the the market's pretty small for top quality defenders I think we saw Man City go out and get some full backs they're you know, 50 or 60 million and maybe Liverpool aren't at that level but is it as much a, as you were saying much a mentality thing as a person absolutely thing. if you put Van Dijk in that back four it marginally make it better but it's the mentality of the team and how they go about winning the ball back when they break through that first press that's the problem so one player is not going to make a difference they need, they need more than one defensive uh, signing shall we say I'm not going to get it in January and probably not next summer because they couldn't do it last summer. We're being so. a bit harsh because they've just won 3-0, but, you know. Yeah, but in terms you, you of the get bigger the point. picture, they've had a good yeah. night tonight. Listen, they've, they've played nobody tonight, but the bigger picture for Liverpool going forward, they are well behind the other teams. The body language doesn't look great. I know we always hear that there's trouble in the camp. They're playing like there's trouble in the camp. They're all over the place. The first five, ten minutes, you're thinking, listen, they're at it. They're going to win this game comfortably. And I was early in the game, but they created one or two chances. But defensively, lack of concentration, players being lazy. The manager at halftime, you know, he's got to make changes. And I'm, the, the two centre halves would give you a heart attack. He'll have to maybe take Boateng <laughs> off. Boateng's walking around the place like it's a, he's, he's playing Sunday football. He's been in disgrace. <laughs> Get him off. In terms of the fullbacks, Roy, how different is it for him having to work with uh, Rose and Aurier today, comparing those two to, to Robertson and Trent Alexander Arnold? Chalk and cheese. Two Tottenham fullbacks. Dreadful. Dumb and dumber, I'd call him. Today, just non existent. And he has been now for a year or two. Whatever about his tactical play or the qualities he has, because he is a quality player. 
But unless you've got the hunger and desire to go in and train properly and try and improve and all this off the field stuff that I see him getting involved in where he thinks he's a male model of some sort. <laughs> the bottom line with Pickford, I'm not joking yeah. Two of So them. that's an error, is it? Because we've got these as, as the, the goalkeepers who've made... I don't need to see them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need to, to see them stats. I know he's not a good goalkeeper. We said it before the game. He's not up to it. And you're talking about Everton making progress he's as a football England club. Goalkeeper. I don't care. He is, he is not, he's not a good goalkeeper. And United, he, need, he needs to win a few more games. He's won nine. Burnley have won ten. Southampton. I was trying I think to tell you that nine. a few weeks ago. I know you were. I wasn't listening to you properly. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, again, I, and I say for Frank, I say to any manager, when you look at all the managers, I have huge respect to all the managers. And I'm the first to say to any manager, yeah, give him a little bit of time. But in the meantime, you do have to win a few games. You've made the point there, Jamie, a draw when Man United have to win tonight because they are running out of games. Because before you know the season will be over, and you go, oh, we ran out of games. They have to start winning games. They've won nine games so far this season. That's not enough for Man United, isn't it? That's his job to make saves. When I hear people saying someone's a good shot stopper or a goalkeeper, is that not what you're supposed to do? Is that the kind of save you would expect him to make? Yeah, yeah. Listen, he's, he's decent at stuff like that, yeah. <laughs> Why? I'm not going to ever win anything. <laughs> they must stay in the Premier League. No, listen, like delighted. That, listen, Dean Smith, we, he's, he's made a good point. We've said it before. There was a big change at the club last summer. It was going to take time. They've stayed up. A big achievement. Celebrations, listen, slight, slightly over the top. But Did you enjoy that celebration, Roy? Uh, what, of Arsenal towards the end? No, way over the top. When I was watching it, I thought there were 10 points clear in the league. The way they were celebrating towards the end. No, no, forget Arsenal. Way over the top celebrations. Beating Newcastle 4-0. Ridiculous. Are you tired of always losing your sports bet? What if you could significantly reduce the chance of losing? Match betting makes it possible by allowing you to cover all potential outcomes of an event and maximize your profit potential. What's match betting? Simply put, it's a betting system through which you can make a profit from bookmaker promotions, no matter the outcome. How? By turning the free bets that bookies offer for signups and existing customers into real cash. Stop guessing and start making profits today by clicking the link in the description below. Do not think this evening in his first major television interview since his dismissal, Roy Keane speaks about the events which led to his departure from Ireland's World Cup squad, how the controversy has affected him and whether there's any possibility of him playing for Ireland in Japan. He spoke this afternoon to Tommy Gorman. What I first want to do is to get you to put in context the reasons for your row. Was it bad blood between you and Mick McCarthy? Was it something deeper? Or was it because you were unhappy with the preparations of the Irish team for the World Cup and you always strive for perfection? Um, I think there's a lot of things. Obviously there's a lot been said over the last few days. Um, I'm not really here to get anybody on my side. I think it's important that people know the truth. Um, the final straw was when uh, I was accused of being disloyal, fake an injury and uh, going against my teammates in front of everybody. And um, I wouldn't accept it. And uh, I still don't accept that. 
that probably was the final straw. But what happened before that? Because the impression we have is of somebody who went over there, was looking to train hard, was looking to prepare for the World Cup, wanted to do well in the World Cup, and just felt that the training just wasn't going well. Is that the case? Yeah, well, from day one when we got over there, um, again, the travelling was, was long. But you, know, you, you accept these things, don't get me wrong. And um, the first night we got there, there was, a, there was a, an evening meal, and uh, Mick got Martin, the doctor, to speak about certain things, you know, to be careful of the sun and some block, of course, and what drinks to drink. And uh, when he was talking about the drinks to take, he went, they're, up, they're not here yet. But And he continued, and I was sitting there, and I thought, they're not here yet. And then Mick came back in, and Mick said about the, the training kit hadn't arrived. Um, the, the training pitch wasn't as good as he, t as he thought. And as soon as Mick said that, I thought, it must be bad. And um, there was no balls, of course. They should have been there on Thursday or Friday or something. I think this was on the Saturday evening when we got there, or the Sunday evening. And um, I, c I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't. Um, that's not being prima donna. It's not being pig-headed. That's just being honest. You know, we're pre preparing for the World Cup finals. And, um, and I was disappointed straight away with that. And, I went, and again, we, I remember we walked outside and there was a few players. There was a bit of a laugh and a joke about it. But I went to my bedroom and... I couldn't understand it. I, I couldn't. So I went to Mick's room that night, about half an hour later, and um, I asked him, I said, Mick, what, what's going on? I can't believe it. He says, well, you know, the skips should have been here towards their Friday. And I said, they should have been here two weeks ago. They should have been here two weeks ago, so there wouldn't have been any doubt. And I said, the training pitch must be bad. If you said it's bad, he went, oh, well, somebody let me down. They promised me a decent training pitch. And I went, well, you've trusted somebody that you're going to guarantee a training pitch when there's not even a, a football pitch in the island. And I said, I'm disappointed with it. And, and well, I left it at that. And he understood my feelings because I had the same problems a few years ago when, you know, after a couple of years when Mick was a manager, I was disappointed with certain things. And I, I arranged to meet Mick. He came to my house and we discussed all these things. And he agreed with me that we need to improve in all aspects, preparing for a game. Would it be travel arrangements, uh, training pitch, everything. And uh, this was the first day we got there and I thought, if this is the way it's going to go, what, what chance have we got? Um, and of course the next morning we were ready to go train. There's no point in bringing any boots because there was no footballs. Uh, there was no training kit. We had to wear the casual gear. We, we were around the hotel. Um, and even I went up for a stretch in the physio's room and a lot of the medical care wasn't there. And some of the lads couldn't have strappings. And it, again, it was a laugh and a joke. And I have a laugh and a joke. I, you know, it's, it's quite funny sometimes. But even the lads had no strappings. And I remember Jason McAdair saying, no, use some toilet roll. And everyone was laughing. Again, I was laughing with it. But deep down, I thought, this is not right. And I, I, was, I was fuming, to be honest. And of course, we've been training. And when I got to the training ground, which was a disgrace, absolute disgrace. And if anybody's been over there, if they say any different, you know, they're not in the real world. And even after training, I was talking to one of the, the liaison officers who was looking after the team when we got over there. I said to him, I said, well, do we have to maybe water it for just tomorrow? And he went, well, probably. He says, to be fair, we weren't expecting you today. And I went, but you must have known we were training. He says, no, nobody told us you were coming down. And that, that was the start of it. And I thought, here we go. But, you know. Did you think that you had support for that kind of approach from the other players? Because they're professionals as well. They were looking to do well in the World Cup. Well, all the players were saying the same. All the players were saying the same to me. That's what I, I think, you know, you, when you're captain for a reason. And I made a point to make on the first night. I thought, I said, it's not good enough, Mick. And the next day, the players, and again, it's a bit of a laugh and a joke, and I accept that, you know. But uh, when, we, when we got there, it was, it was so dangerous. Um, I said from the start, I went, there's going to be injuries here. Well, of course, three days later, there was three injuries. Um, and it didn't surprise me about this. So, you threatened to leave, you wanted to come home, that was sorted out. And then you had this bust up. And you were obviously very angry that you were confronted in public, as it were, in front of all the other squad members. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, on the Tuesday after I told Mick that I was leaving, and I did tell him for personal reasons, because I didn't really want to tell him that I'd had enough of playing for him. I really had. Uh, because when we trained on the Tuesday, again, the pitch, 
any of it. Again, that's the tip of the iceberg, to be fair. And uh, I said I needed to go on. And uh, again, that was supposed to have been a private conversation. We spoke to Eddie Cochran, who was going to organise a flight, and they promised it wouldn't go beyond the three of us. And an hour or two later, I met Alan Kelly, who says, oh, you're going home? And, you know, I thought, yeah. But of course, during the night, things were sorted out, to be fair, on that front. Um, but I think Nick was disappointed that I'd put him in an awkward position, because, to be fair, he ran Colin Healy. And I told him I felt bad about that. I said, I felt sorry for Colin. And I said, look, I'll go home. And that was my last words to Mick, you know, leave it, don't ring him back. But the first thing in the morning, Mick Brown came to see me and he said, you know, you've got three minutes to make up your mind. I said, well, I'll stay. But I think in a, a little bit was, I think Mick was put under pressure from the FAI of some sort. That's because I was speaking to my solicitor and I spoke to Alex Ferguson during the night and they told me to stick it out. And um, so from there on, I think Mick was disappointed, right, you know. But I felt I was entitled to change my mind. And I changed my mind an hour later to try and give Mick the chance. But he said he'd already spoke to Colin Eddie half eight in the morning on his mobile. And I said to him, I said, by your body language, you know, um, you, know you, you don't really want me here. And he said, no, no, but you know, you've put me in an awkward position. I, I wish you thought about me. And I went, I feel quite embarrassed by it all anyway, you know, but I've decided to stick it out. Um, but my last words were to him, you know, he left my room and I, I followed him down and knocked on the door. Mick Byrne answered the door. I said to Mick, leave and I'm going home. But of course, during the night, um, as I said, after speaking to one or two people, Mick Byrne came back to my room. He said, you've got three minutes to make your mind up. And I said, well, I'll stay. So um, that was that. And to be fair, on the, the Sunday or Monday when we got over there, I, I promised Tom Humphreys and uh, Paul Kimmage, two reporters, you know, I'd have some sort of respect for, that I'd speak to him on the Wednesday. I wouldn't do a press conference, I think, until the Friday or the Sunday, but all the other press. But these two lads asked me, and I said, yeah, I'll do it. And of course, the Wednesday, I, I told them my disappointments with things. And, uh, and towards the morning, Tom Humphreys rang me in my room about half six, seven in the morning. But I was awake anyway. We were all wake, waking up quite early. And he said, I'd like to go through this piece with you because it's going to print in a few hours. And I said, OK. And I met him downstairs at 8 o'clock. And I said, it's fine. No, no problems. And I went to print in the Times on the towards the morning. The towards the afternoon, you know, the storm clouds were gathering. I just knew it. Nobody spoke to me. Even Mick Byrne, who I've been very close to in the Irish squad, I said to him in his body language, I says, Mick, I understand you have to be loyal to Mick, you know. He said, well, I know you in a long time, but I says, no, no, you, you need to stick with Mick type of thing, you know. And I went for my meal at half six on the Thursday, and I was told there was a meeting at half past seven. And I knew what it was all about. I knew. And, uh, but Roy, do you see that from Mick McCarthy's perspective, this was a challenge to him. You were the team captain. He was the manager. Here was this article in the paper. OK, maybe he made a mistake the article, in bringing it yep, the into article, the public. The article in the paper was fine. If, if anybody reads it, it's fine. Uh, you don't think that it might have undermined the morale of the other players? That, you know, you'd no, be critical no, as a training if you, preparation. If you read it, it's fine. Anybody who read the piece, it's, it's fine. I questioned the training facilities, which I said to Mick. And that was about it. Okay, so that, that's your view. And you had your discussion with them. You had this angry exchange. The that was more than an angry exchange. Um, it was the meeting at half past seven, and Mick came in, and I knew what it was about. He had a piece of paper. I knew it was the interview. Um, he goes on to say, you know, some people are disappointed. And I'm sitting there, and I'm saying, Roy, just you know, stay calm, because I know he was going to make the point. And I knew, I said I'd stick it out, and I knew the next day we were going to a different place, and it was going to be decent training facilities. And, and players that spoke to me, all the players, I'd spoke to Steve Finney before that, during the meal. And I said, how's your ankle? He said, lucky I was walking. He said, if, if I was running, I, I would have broke it. No doubts about it. And the other players had said to me, they've not done enough training, um, because a lot of them play, a few of them play in the first division, which finished four or five weeks ago. And two players off the top of my head said to me, they went, we've not done enough in four weeks. Now, I know I was going over there and it's a relaxing trip. I appreciate that. And a few lads had a few nights out. I've had more nights out than anybody. And that's great. And I had a laugh the next day. They were telling me the few stories that went on. And I didn't mind that. You know, players need to let off a bit of steam. I accept that. But on the other hand, if you're going over there to work, let's, let's work for that one hour a day. That's not asking too much. Um, there's all sorts coming out and I give people hell. I tell people the truth and they think it's hell. And it's as straightforward as that. And then it mixed after that about the meeting. I said, uh, well, some people aren't ha happy with certain things, the travel arrangements. I picked this I picked this island he was talking about. I picked the train and pitch and if people aren't happy about it. And I interrupted him, I said, Mick, I said, we should have done this in private, like we did the other night. I interrupted him, I said, well, just get to the point. He says, well, okay, I will. You know, you're not happy with certain things. I says, well, I told you I'm not happy with certain things. Roy, do you, do you accept that the language used 
wasn't very nice. I know Alex Ferguson has used expletives in his time. I know Mick McCarthy has done it as well. But you accept that it's not the kind of language one expects from a leader of men. Leader Especially of men. When it gets out. Well, this was well again. This was a private meeting. This was a private team meeting. But even I didn't, if, even, even if it I didn't call it. I didn't call a press off uh, press uh, conference 15 minutes after the meeting. I didn't. I didn't go and say what apparently people were saying. But how about the actual language itself? Do you accept that it wasn't it wasn't very complimentary to McCarthy, and that he was justified in feeling hurt by it? Justified in questioning my loyalty to my country, asking the lads in front of me to send the Iran match. I faked an injury when he spoke to my manager in front of me. He knew I wasn't right. I spoke to Alex Forbes on the Sunday morning. I hadn't played for three and a half weeks. I report I played the Saturday. We won 2-0. The manager said, right, that's a positive result. The flight, he hadn't played for three and a half weeks. It wouldn't be good for my knee. That was the medical advice I had. Mick Byrne, the physio, came to my room the Saturday night. I told him it was a little bit sore. The Sunday morning, Alex Forbes rang me and Mick was there. And I said, look, the manager wants me to go back because he classed it 2-0 as a good result. And Mick said, right, thanks for coming over. We knew you weren't quite right. He said that to me. And I said to him at the minute, I said, you're a liar. But I'm still trying to say calm at this stage. But I'm not going to accept that. Not in front of my teammates and the staff. And I, I, wouldn't, I won't accept it. I will not accept it. But will you accept that if it was wrong on his side, in the language you used to him, that you were wrong, that you made a mistake maybe in going too hard? If I felt for one second, for one second, I was a little bit out of order, I'd apologise and I'd go back and I'd love to play in the World Cup. But, but I'm 100% right. I know I am. And that's not been arrogant or cocky. The last few days, it's been hard. Of course it has been. Everybody wants to play in the World Cup. But things that went on in that room, you know, people knew, weren't happy with conditions. Senior players agreed with me. They could have had their say and they just sat there. And I walked out of that room and I walked out of my career, my international career. Not one person backed me up, not one. And does, when, does that not make you suspect that maybe in the language you use, at the very least, that mm. you were wrong? Mm. Like, is that, that's not the kind of language you'd want children to be hearing about. Yes, You're a role model. It was a private meeting amongst grown men. It was a private meeting. These things aren't supposed to go out. That's why I went to Mick's room on the Sunday night. And I discussed it with Mick. I, said, I discussed it. And I said, Mick, I, I can't believe it. I can't believe we've come all the way. And it, we've, the training pitch is the way it's supposed to be. We've got no training kit. Mick, Mick was the one who called it in front of everybody else. And said I turned my back on the players. And I faked injury not to go to Iran. When he knew damn well I, was, I wasn't right. And he spoke to my man manager. So obviously there's going to be language. I wasn't going to sit there and say, excuse me, Mick, I think you're a little bit out of order. I, of course you're going to use language. And I said things to Mick. And I, I'm 100% behind what I said. And again, Are you sorry for the way you said it? Um, no, and it's not a sign of weakness if you say you're sorry. I, I agree with you. But no, as I said over the last few days, usually, no matter what you might do in life, you make decisions, whether it be moving house, moving jobs, getting your hair cut, buying a pair of shoes, and you might have some doubts, did I do the right thing? But the last few days, no. I don't feel, there's not one doubt in my mind where I stand. Not one doubt. And uh, that's good enough for me. How about Mick McCarthy? There's a view in Ireland that he's an honest man, that he's a decent man, that as a footballer he was always honest, always honest, he always did his best. Do you go along with that view oh, about him? Oh, Mick's obviously had a very good career and he's done very well. And I personally wouldn't say I know Mick that well, you know. All I know is the dealings I've had with him. And to be fair, over the few years, my relationship with Mick, he's, he's been very understanding in certain situations, you know, with friendly matches, you know, and coming in a couple of days late for, for certain matches, and he's been very understanding. And uh, there was one or two games where he's let me go home for one or two days when we've been away for maybe ten days with two international matches. And uh, he's been very understanding. Um, but all that came to an end the other night. But do you respect him? Do you have? Do you recognise that in the course of his career he put his foot in when it hurt, that he did his best for Ireland at every time, did. that he was trying to do yeah, his best well, as a I manager? Watched, I, obviously, I watched Ireland. I grew up watching him. He done very well for Ireland, like a lot of other players. And do you think he was doing his best as a manager? 
didn't know. I think it was at fault, but that's my opinion. And of course, football is all about opinions. That's why it's a great game. That's why you get people in the pubs, everywhere you go, taxi drivers, it's all about opinions. I know that, and I accept it. But I'm entitled to my opinion. I know, but we're not talking about how good he was. We're talking about his sincerity and his integrity in trying to do his best. Because that's the perception most Irish people have of Mick McCarthy, that he does his best. Well, he probably does do his best. You know, sometimes in life, it, it can be very ironic because it said that one of the first rows you had with him was when you, you were a younger player and when he balled you out of it after you went out late. That's according to accounts I've read, yeah. accounts in which you've been interviewed. And do you not see the irony that here you are crossing swords with McCarthy because one of the things that's annoying you now is maybe that fellas were going out late at night and maybe taking things too lax. No, that didn't annoy me. I just said players need to go out and enjoy themselves. I heard him coming in five, six, seven in the morning and the next morning they told me all about it. it was great and good luck to him good luck to him I haven't got a problem with that people make out I'm a loner and I lock myself in my room I think I'm very approachable a lot of the Irish lads I've spoke to a lot of them have approached me and I'm always willing to give people advice but I, as I said I've had my nights out but I was getting ready for a World Cup and as I said good luck to him they're entitled to enjoy themselves I haven't got a problem with that one bit I spoke to Mick, and when we got there, there was a barbecue range on the Monday night with the press. But that's not my scene. That's not my scene. I said it to Mick. You know, there's people in the press I've had disagreements over the years. You know, and I felt I didn't really want to, to want to go, but I went. But Mick said, we want the press on our side, and I, I couldn't understand it. I really couldn't. But I went to the barbecue, but I went to bed about 9, 10 o'clock, and the lads went out. They had a great night. And good luck to him. Good luck to him. There's this very soft side to you. I saw you the other day when you were being pursued by the photographers and a wee lad in says something to you about Manchester United and you smiled and you turned around to him and you said, thanks very much, son. Yeah. I saw your, your children waiting at the windows when you were coming home. They were delighted to see you home. Well, what about all the little kids in Ireland who have you as a role model? Who love you, who, are, who would love to see you back in the World Cup and who are absolutely appalled that this row has taken place and don't know what to say. Exactly. Well, I, I, you know, do you think I've enjoyed the last few days? It's been hard. Of course it has. I'd love to play in the World Cup. I played in 94. It was fantastic. Eight long years ago. And I've done no more, no less than the other lads in the squad to get us back. And uh, I would love to play. Of course I would. But, um, you know, again... And everyone in the country, from the tea shook down, would love to see this result. You know, there are 13, 14 year olds who tell their parents, I don't want to play football anymore, I'm depressed. Well, Kids who wear your, you know, jerseys with your name on it, they're absolutely haunted by what's going on. They don't know what to make of it. Well, that'll pass. People have to get on with their lives, you know. It's a football tournament. My loyalty was questioned. I was called a liar in front of a group of people. And then after that, of course, there was more to it. As I said, I didn't realise it was a press conference. I think within a half an hour, maybe less. And I know the kids in Ireland, and I feel bad for it myself. Of course I do. But I want to go back to Ireland. I want, I've got my family over there. You know? But is it, you know, I have to stand up for what I believe in. I'll live and die by my actions. And I will continue to do so. I tell my kids what's right and what's wrong. But what happened to me was wrong. But you... You're an Irish man and very proud of it. You know the country we live in. We know in the north we're asking people who have been at each other's throats for years and years to make compromises, to say I'm sorry, to put up their hands, to shake hands. And here we have our football team riven by division, destroyed by division. Is there no way that you, Mick McCarthy, the Irish footballers, can give people an example and show what people in the north and people in the country are trying to do, that you're prepared to do the same? Or is that alien to you guys? No, it's not. As I said, if for one second, if I thought, since I got back home the other day, for one second I thought, maybe, Roy, maybe you were a little bit out of order, or maybe there's a way back. I'd be back on that flight. No doubt in my mind about that. But I went to my room and we had three players in a press conference. Within 20 minutes, a half an hour of it. Send her behind Mick. When they, we'd all spoke about it. People look at them as role models. They're cowards. I 
know that in football, the guy who pulls out of a tackle or the guy who compromises is seen as weak. That he's not the kind of guy you want in a team. But in life, sometimes it's the guy who compromises, the guy who offers the apology, that he gains strength from that. I agree with you 100%. Life's too short. Life's too short. Would it not be a very but big thing for you if I, went, if I went back, I couldn't give 100% for my country. I couldn't. Under what circumstances? When players turned around and said, I went, I went I, they never heard anything like it in their lives. And I, I expect them to stick together. I'm well aware of that, you know. It's a squad and they're all back in Mick. But when they spoke to me, you know, when they had our chance to speak up, they didn't. But I can't worry about them all. I can look at myself, you know. I can look in the mirror and say, I've done the right thing. Nobody wants this. Of course, as you said, there's people all over the world and they're killing each other and stuff, you know. Nobody wants this. But I have to stand up for what I believe in and I will continue to do so, you know. But when um, rows are taking place, harsh things are said on all sides. I agree with you. I have had arguments with it. But thousands of people, thousands of people, but teammates at United, all the time, it's been forgotten about. But when I go back to my room, and one or two players come to my room, two players came to, it was about Ian Hart came to say goodbye for a play to him, Jason McIntyre, and I couldn't see Staunton came, but at the time I didn't know they'd been to a press conference, and they thought I went too far, and I said, I respect your opinion, but, you know, I'm sticking to my guns. Alan Kelly came to say that he'd been to the press conference, which, again, when they were talking about a press conference, I actually thought they meant that morning. I thought they couldn't have had enough time to just speak to the press. But when Alan explained to me later on that night that they had it straight away, I thought, I couldn't believe it. But I thought, I better leave it going now because everything's done. And two players came to my room and they said to me, we respected everything you said, Troy. Everything you said, but we want to play in the World Cup. And I said, I appreciate your honesty. Thanks a lot, lads. And they said, is there any consolation when you left the room? I think they said, no, Quinn said, look, lads, we need to stick together. Blah, blah, blah. And there was a round of applause. And they said, if there's any consolation, we didn't clap. And I thought, you know, fair play, lads, you know, but obviously the, the damage is done. The next morning, I heard them all leaving. They were leaving at 8 o'clock. Mick Byrne went everybody up. Of course, I didn't sleep too great. And I've been, I've been involved in Ireland since I was 15, Irish under 15, 16, huge, 21s, the senior team. And I heard them all leaving. Mick Byrne knocked at the door and I opened and he says, I'm, we're away. And he shook his hand and I said, he took, stuck his hand out and said, good luck, Mick. No, I, I felt I deserved better than that, you know. I, I know people in that squad a long time, staff as well. And when I walked out of that room in the meeting, a private meeting, I knew, I knew that that was the end of it. I knew there was no going back. Because, I, again, yeah, I've, got, I've got my pride, I've got my principles, and I wonder if anybody accusing me of these things. And people said I question Mick not being Irish, which is nonsense. Nonsense. But Roy, there are signs up in shops all over the country. Come back, Roy. We want Roy Keane. The general election result was forgotten very quickly when this broke out. This is a huge talking country. And I'm sure everyone from your family to the people who have supported you over the years, they'd love to see you back. They'd love to see you make that gesture. They'd love to see Mick McCarthy make the gesture. They'd love to see the players make the gesture. They'd love to see the best representation of Ireland possible. And they think Ireland, without you, given the role you play to get us here, that it's not the country we want to follow. It's not the team we want to support. Well, I just hope that people just get behind the team. I think that is the most important thing. Uh, I spoke to my family and and they were supposed to fly over, but then I fly now because they backed me because I told them what happened. I might be a lot of things, but I, I'm not a liar. And I told them. I had to arrange my own flights coming back. Things like that. I waited in the room for two, two or three hours. Nobody approached the room from the FBI. I said, that's why I booked, I rang United and asked them to book a flight to come back. I remember all these things. Nobody was in the room when I walked out. And people had an opportunity to speak. They had the chance and they wouldn't. They had the chance. I understand some of the younger players obviously not wanting to say, you know, because they, it, was, it was a heated exchange, of course it was. But some of the senior players, they, they, knew, they knew the score, put it that way. And they let it all happen. And I said, when I walked out that door, that was the end of it. That was the end of it. Put the balls out on my court, you know. And uh, as I said, I didn't want to go through the media. 
I didn't want to be doing this interview today. I didn't want to speak to the mail over the weekend. But I got back into London Saturday morning. My solicitor was there at six o'clock in the morning. And he said, Roy, you know, you need to say something because there's an imbalance of the story. And I thought, I was writing a hard, obviously, some of the stuff that was coming up about me, which wasn't true. A lot of nonsense about my wife. Uh, nonsense, you know, and I thought, I need to speak out. That's from the interview today because the people of Ireland deserve to know the truth. But again, it's all about opinions, and people say I probably shouldn't have reacted the way I, I should. But in hindsight, of course, it's a great thing. But uh, I'm human. And as I said, I, I think I was forced into a corner. I really was. That's my honest belief. And uh, there was only one way I was going to come, and I was out fighting. There was only going to be one winner, and that was Mick, of course. And I understand that. He's the manager. But and you're uh, everybody is a loser in this current situation. I don't There's know. Winner. No, I think... No, I think hopefully the team will do well. We've got some good players. And uh, hopefully they, they, they will do well. And I'm sure they will. Are you going to be here in Manchester or on holidays somewhere following the results? And in 10, 15 years' time, are you going to say to yourself, Cripes, what was it all about? If only we could have sorted it out there and then. I could have played. As I said, there's no doubt in my mind. Since I've come home, family are glad to see me. It was good to be home. It was. You know, I'm going to probably go back to Cork next week for a few days. Um, but as I said, my conscience is clear. It really is. As I said, I can... I know I'm probably repeating myself, but if there was any doubt in my mind that Roy, oh, you're a little bit, a little bit out of order, you know, you should have maybe held it back a little bit. I'd be back like a shot. But I won't accept it. I can't accept it. Is there not a, a part of you that says, look, forget about pride. What's more important is, is going out and doing the I've best for that, the country. I've done that many times. I've been doing it for years. And yeah, you're prepared to do it again, or is there no hope of that? The ball's not on my side of the court, you know. The ball's not on my side of the court. If you thought that they'd take you back, that the players wanted they'd you back. They'd take me back? I, yeah. What do you mean if they'd take well, me back? If they thought that they'd love to have you in the team, that Mick McCarthy was prepared to bury the hatchet with you, that he was prepared to apologise, to meet you halfway, that the players wanted you back, what would Roy Keane, the guy who pulls I on really the green jersey, do? I really don't know. Because no, I can't see it happening. As yes, I said, but say, say that we're willing to do that. No. Are you still open to that kind of generosity? You know, we'd have to see. We really would. As I said, I would love to play in the water. Because the country would love you back. I'd love to be back. But it's, as I said, it's, it's up to other people. As I said, uh, are you willing to, yeah, to meet them halfway? People right? weren't in that room. People but are weren't you in that room. To meet them halfway. Are you willing to make any gesture? Because the country would love you back, and it would do so much to lift the morale of kids who will never have a chance. I don't know. I really don't know. As I said. I need to stand up for what I believe in. And I agree with what you believe you have in is representing kids like that a lot of the time. You know, I understand you're the most that. honest professional I, I in Old Trafford. I understand all that. I understand all that. Couldn't agree with you more. But people weren't in that room that night. People weren't there in the morning when the players were leaving. Yeah, but that's, 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 that's your argument within a, a group of players. But what about the country? What about the country that wants you, mm -hmm. that wants to respect you, that wants to follow a team? You obviously feel but I felt torn years, by that. I feel I've earned the respect to have my say. That's why I'm captain. That's why I made the points. When you go on the team, you want players behind you. There you, need, you need your teammates behind you. Yeah, there is talk that there are some players now who really would want to have you back. Maybe so, but maybe they're worried about their own reputations, you no, see. Maybe they're decent people who say Roy Keane is a good fella and that the country deserves to have the best team but possible. They are decent people, I'm not saying that. But they had their chance, they had their chance to speak last week. You know? I think deep down they're probably worried about their own reputations. Steve Stoughton, Al Quinn, Alan Kelly went to the press conference. They're senior players, they're experienced. It'd be different if you dragged three young players in. And they had their chance. Steve Sarton's obviously going to be the captain. He's returning he's return after the World Cup anyway. Niall Quinn, he's returning after the World Cup. Niall Kelly's returning after the World Cup. Yeah, but you see how things can, can get misunderstood. For instance, you were the one who went and said you had personal problems because you were trying to protect Mick McCarthy. Oh, I understand right? it, yeah. Isn't that right? That's right, yeah. But that was done the Tuesday. Right. And it was so a Wednesday then, morning. Mick had a, the, the Wednesday evening, Mick had a meeting. and said everything's finished with. It was obviously things went down yesterday, especially with the argument with Packy and Alan. And it was forgotten about. And I agreed. I, I was speaking to Alan that night. And that was forgotten about. But then the rumour mill was things were out of control because of this personal problem things. What were people to think? And they got 
the wrong idea and the players didn't know what to think and you can see how things got out of hand. These guys were not vindictively going for you to assassinate Roy Keane. These are guys who've played with you for years I understand and don't that, like yeah. you. I understand that. I understand that. One point that, that, that strikes me is this time last year, GAA, a sport you love, Galway had a row in their camp. The manager fought with the Donlan brothers. They lost the first round in the championship. They found a way to make up, to compromise. Galway went on to win the All-Ireland and they all grew from that. Surely soccer, with all the professionalism in it, uh, and all the values that you as a human being try to practice, surely you can find a way of showing the same kind of example. Maybe, maybe. But it's, it's out of my hands, it really is. As I said, I'm, uh, I'm standing firm for what I believe in. I'm standing firm because you know, I've got the rest of, you know, I try to live my life as honest as I can. I've made mistakes, probably more mistakes than anybody. And I've done things that I'm ashamed of over the years. But I'm sticking to my guns because I believe, you know, my gut feeling is right. What happened to me last week was wrong. It was wrong. And you can go around the houses and talk about different things. But it was wrong. What happened to me last week, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. I felt I deserved better. Now, of course I lost my temper. People will tell you that, people who know me, but people make me out to be a monster and I'm a loner and that's nonsense, absolute nonsense. But as I said, what happened last week will uh, live with me for a long time. And I tell my kids, as I said, what's right and what's wrong. And what happened to me was wrong. So the ball is in other people's court and gather from what I've been reading the last few days. That's, that's what you've been reading, and you're actually talking about... Your well, I saw Mick on the telly on Saturday. That's how I'm getting interviewed. That's why I'm doing this interview. A lot of the stuff's been in the paper. Yeah, but you're, you're talking about, about your sense of, of grievance. And sense of grievance? What, well, what, I'm just what giving, do you feel you're I'm not talking about my to. sense of grievance. I'm giving my side of the story. No, but, right. But you say what was done to you was wrong, and you've explained why. But aren't wrongs all relative things? And what about the sense of wrong to those poor people who save their money, who follow Ireland, who love you, who want to teach your kids, yes, you're right, he is a hero, he's a fantastic fella. What about the sense of confusion they feel, that ye guys can't sort this out as adults? Well, you're probably right, you know, as I said, uh, I'm agreeing with you a lot of your points. And I do realise there's, there's kids in Ireland, there's people in Ireland, my family were supposed to travel and it's all got messy, but nobody wanted that, nobody. And as you said, maybe there, there is a way, maybe there is, but... Who knows, who knows, and we'll have to wait and see, you know, the, the match is sad, we're running out of time, uh, but as I said, my conscience is clear and that is the most important thing in my life, it really is. But if the other parties in this come to you, the FAI, Mick McCarthy, a proud man, the players, if they come to you and say, for the good of the country, we want to find a solution to this, we'd like it to be playing for Ireland. Are you willing to meet them halfway? I want to play for Ireland. We'll have to see. Possibly, yes. But I, there's nobody wants to play for much as Ireland as me. As I said, I've been involved since I was 15, 14, going for trials up in Dublin. And this is what it's all about, playing in World Cups. So, hopefully, you never know. You just never know. But, uh, no, we'll see. It's hurting you, this. Oh, of course it's hurting me. Dead right it is.
bro, it's, it's about 17 years probably working out today since I first met you, since we first became teammates. One thing that always sticks out in my mind with you is your dislike for players doing interviews. You've read it in your book and a couple of times as well. So what do you make of this? No, I, no, 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 no. Yeah. I didn't have a dislike from doing it. It was just yeah. when they were doing it and, and they, 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 they didn't do too many of them. No, yeah. I, I understood that you have to do interviews and there's a media commitment. But I wasn't going around like, like a madman saying, lads, don't be doing interviews. I just felt get the balance yeah. right, focus on the plane and, and do your little bits and pieces, but not too much. So let's get yeah. that straight. All right, okay, okay. And just one other thing that you used to mention as well. I remember you saying it once, clearly once as well, just a, another little thing you said. If you ever was doing a punditry, you have a license to shoot you. Now, what do you, what, what, what do you, do you remember saying that? I'm not sure. No. But I'm not doing punditry. When you were doing oh, punditry. Oh, when I was doing it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I've said a lot of things over the years. It doesn't mean to say I'm going to stick to it, you know. Yeah. And I, and I wasn't working, you know. I just thought I'd have yeah. a go off it. And, um, and strange enough, I did enjoy it. But I, I didn't feel it was, it was a challenge. And the difference as well, I think when, when people are doing the punditry, I had that mm. desire to still to get back involved. I've nothing against the lads who, who, who carry on doing it, but I still thought I, I want to go out and, and do something in terms of coaching or managing. So when I had an opportunity to get back involved, obviously I jumped at it. But I'm not, mm. you know, I'm not anti-media or anti-punditry or anything like this. I just, I, I just, I'm comfortable now with what I'm doing. Mm. Why do you think it wasn't a challenge then when you were doing that? It just didn't rock my boat. Yeah. I just, uh, just didn't rock my boat. I just felt I should be doing more. I have a lot more to give to football. And I think sometimes on the side of a pitcher in the studio, I just thought, no, nah, there's... I'm kind of... I'm better than this. <laughs> if you yeah. know what I mean. I want to do more. And I feel bad saying that. But no, I just had that, that desire. Cheers, yeah. You know, not to be more hands-on. <laughs> yeah. Not to be more yeah. hands-on. And, and, and to have more of an influence, shall we say. Because it, it is when you're, you're sitting in the, in the studio or, or I was travelling to games, I just felt... No, well, I, I'm not really making a difference to the game. I'm, I'm giving my opinion. Okay, fair enough, and, and people can uh, and debate that. But I just miss that. Even been back in the dressing room, or even the highs or the lows of it. Yeah, I, I miss that. Mm. You've opened up in your book, and you've talked about a lot of your own personal issues. How difficult was that discussing or or, or saying about your own personal issues along the way? Uh, yeah, it probably wasn't part of my plan because mm. uh, obviously when I was a player, I was a midfielder, the skinhead, you know this. I suppose this tug, this, you know what I mean? Uh, no weaknesses and all that carry on. But I think Roddy done a good job. Roddy was, Ro Roddy's quite clever with his writing. I think he kind of, he sucked me in a little bit and softened me up. Yeah. So uh, no credit to Roddy for that, but I don't mind. I think the book, well, when you're doing a book, I try not to overanalyze it. I just try to listen, tell a few stories here and there, reflect a little bit, um, defend myself a little bit, because a lot of been stuff said over the years about me from ex-teammates, uh, ex-manager that I just felt no no listen I've you know I've got to defend myself here because nobody else is mm. is that why you did the book is that what it was just about specific to defend yourself is that no, what you the, more or less the, felt no there was a number of reasons the, the, the fact is uh, I wasn't working I wasn't doing much um, the, the offer uh, the chance to work with Roddy to people say settle a few scores I, I wouldn't go that far but yeah that was mm. part of me thought so I need to get my side of the story out there if people think I'm going on every day shouting and ranting and raving <laughs> Mm. I had a few days like that, as we all do, but it wasn't every single day. So I just thought, ah, ah we'll go for it. Was it Sir Alex Ferguson's book last year that accelerated that process a little bit? Did, did he? <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. go that far, no, yeah. but I just felt, you know, it's a, it's a bit harsh, you know, for, for, for whether to, to criticise me or, you know, the, the other players. When you consider, I, th I think, what we've we done okay for the club, you know, we'd had a little bit of success, won a few trophies, and there we have a manager, you know, um, criticising us all, a manager who's made millions of pounds out of us, you know, got statues and stands there after him, and he thinks he can sit back and criticise us without anybody saying anything to him because he thinks he's, he's got all this power. And I thought, no, 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 well, why, why, should I, why should we sit back and listen to this nonsense? Because nobody ever questions him. Mm. Everyone's frightened to death of him. The media, um, ex, ex teammates of mine, Fergie's this, Fergie's that talking nonsense so I thought no no enough's enough why should I put up with that do you not think you've done the similar sort of thing with this book that you've brought out then you've been quite critical of a couple of your teammates and maybe even players that you've worked worked or worked under you as well what, what team what, who have I been critical of um, I just remember reading the bit about Greg Halford a little bit as well you kind of judged him straight away you did yeah quite quickly on that one yeah I probably was a bit harsh on that yeah, yeah no, no no you're right but he didn't he, we didn't he didn't bring me success yeah difference of Ferguson we, we you know we we've we done really well for him 
Craig done very little for me and I just yeah. felt and I don't, I don't think I was that hard man you know I think I'm critical on a few players who I felt weren't focused on the job um, no I, no I think that's different I, yeah. I, I think again and, and these lads didn't work me for 12 and a half years you know th these, are, these are players I brought in and, and yeah no you're right it can be a little bit out of order maybe but I think the balance is okay with it mm. do you, so your relationship with Sir Alex Ferguson and now total non-existent you, would you what would you do if you met him now what would you I do I haven't got a clue you know yeah. I, truthfully I'd probably have a go at him yeah 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 why not what would what would you say? Just why are you talking nonsense about us? Why are you, mm. you why are you talking rubbish about me and, and other lads you, who've done well? Yeah, I'd probably mm. say that to him. And, 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 I, and he'd probably defend himself. He'd yeah. probably take, take a run and jump as as, as you'd expect. But I, I just don't see why we have to sit back and accept it. And people go, well, mm. you know, it's, it was always about power and control for him, and, and he thinks he can do that now. And I'm 43 years of age. What, what, what am I supposed to be frightened of? Him? Frightened of him or scared of these people? You got to take him on. So, and it's football's a small world. So I'm pretty sure we will cross each other. Yeah. I look forward to it. Does it sadden you a bit though the way that it has gone, considering that you both had such a big influence on each other's well, career? No, I wouldn't say saddens me, mm. Kevin. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say saddens me. It doesn't keep me keep me awake at night where I go, oh, you know, wish it was different. Uh, no, that's, that's the industry we're in, you know, you, you, you try and work with people and have a bit of success mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, um, they, they, you know, they can be critical of you. Yeah, I don't mind people being critical of me, whether it be ex-teammates or ex-managers, but when it's lies, it's different. There's a big difference. Mm. You've spoken in your book about a few of the self-doubts that you've had as well, insecurities probably that you had through your playing career as well. How do you deal with that considering the amount of success that you had and probably you were targeted a lot on the pitch as well, probably people target you as being that main leader, that main yeah. mainstay of the side yeah, of the I, I, Hopefully, I, you know, sometimes when I talk about stuff like that, it's, it's, it's not all negative, it's just obviously there was weaknesses there, that there was self-doubt, particularly when I was coming towards the end with injuries and contract situations and... Um, but I also use it as a form of energy to drive me on to make sure that we don't lose football matches. You, you keep this act up, and, and my act, I suppose, I built over the years, again, mm. with the skinhead and a few sending offs, is that I fear nothing and uh, some sort of machine, which, again, is nonsense. But you act, don't you? Did you feel like when you were playing, I read that in the book, you sort of felt sometimes you felt like a bit of an actor. Did oh, well, you actually well, think I, that yourself well, when think, you were playing? Well, I think it is. I think it is. I think in different parts of your life, when you're at home with your family or you're... Uh, you're going to work or you're playing on a Saturday at 3 o'clock yeah. I think you, you, it is an act it is a different show because you can't you're obviously not acting like that when you get home or when I'd be in the dressing rooms or I'm having goals with people or they're having a go at me you're, you're getting in the zone I know other sports people do exactly the same I'm pretty sure boxers must be the same I, I see the rugby league lads but you, you, you obviously don't behave like that 24 hours a day so it, it is an act I think it's a, I think we're all actors in a sense it's just one big game but you know it's um, yeah it's a big game isn't it yeah how d how do you uh, you judge your or how do you view your managerial career as a whole certainly at Ipswich and, and Sunderland how do you view it as a whole a bit hit and miss I have mm. to say I, I think Sunderland uh, for, for all the, I suppose the criticism I got I, I think I've done okay there I, I know okay is not enough sometimes but Ipswich big problem for me at Ipswich too many draws recruitment was poor selling Jordan Rhodes big mistake even though I can obviously blame other people for that as well a little but I have to take responsibility for that but it does not got on in my manager career where I've looked back and I've reflected and thought it's not for me I yeah. think no no I think I've got a chance of being a manager. Do you look a bit, bit, bit of more pride do you not think you undersell yourself what you did at Sunderland? Maybe Considering so. the position that they were when you took over. But that's part of my makeup as well to drive me yeah. on I, I don't think I'd be one for sitting back on you know like even at United we all you know we'd won trophy I feel we should have won two I think if, even we won the triple I was thinking well we could, maybe could have had you know could have had another trophy thrown in there mm. I think that, that that's part of my makeup what that drives me on I'd hate to sit back and go things are great lads we won the league no no you always think can we do better and Sunderland certainly I think was a successful period in terms of getting promoted and also staying up in the premiership when we did a lot of injury problems absolutely and and then of course when we, the season I left we were actually doing not too bad um, but obviously when you fall out with the owner there's only going to be one winner Ips which is disappointing so yeah I, I, the Sunderland was stuff I wouldn't say I was successful but I achieved what I wanted to set you know achieve when I went up there but uh, there's enough in my makeup and, uh, and my mindset when I look back at my my brief spell as a manager to say yeah I think I can do something in the game and w what have you learnt if anything when you, from the, that time that you had as manager certainly now considering you're number two as yeah well. I, 
do you know what I, I think I was what I have learned working now with, at Villa and obviously with Martin now with Ireland is that I think I was doing a lot of decent stuff you know but my recruitment the, the, the big one is the recruitment you know you, bu you buy bad players you end up with a bad mm. team that's pretty straightforward and I bought bad mm. players at Ipswich yeah. although I tried to get you and you, you know, obviously we couldn't get that deal on that one might have made a difference it, yeah. Yeah. but uh, that's something <laughs> and I bought in good players and we had a good team and we got momentum I couldn't get at Ipswich 20 draws you know you need that mm. goal score so um, ah, yeah. you, you always reflect every now and mm. again but that's football isn't yeah. it well, one, there's one thing that intrigued me when you were manager of is that you kind of just didn't really go and settle up there you can't you had a, you had your place you had a, a city and a, uh, in your house with the yeah. telly and all the, this story didn't really do your office it's you always it was always a box ready to leave yeah. that was kind of mentality yeah, but I, I've always got yeah that I think that I'm fine with that I think you have to be ready I hate I'd hate to be in a job and go well I, I you know I'm gonna decorate I'll be here for three years I even know with Villa I always think you know maybe another week we maybe only got a week left I always think that I always think um, you know I always doubt yourself so I think that why, keeps, why do you, why do you doubt I think that like keeps that? you on your toes yeah. I think if you get comfortable and relax and think you've achieved something I think you're in big trouble so that idea of up in Sunderland and me having a little flat and living off pot noodles and beans on toast I think that was that was okay that that didn't cause me problems was my disagreement <laughs> with, with the owner <laughs> not the pot noodles that caused me the trouble up there so no no I think no you, you gotta you gotta keep yourself on your toes yeah yeah Jared Piquet recently described you as scary. Did you see that? Did you see him saying that? Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Do you think uh, well, again, all that stuff doesn't help really in the sense that, again, people on about me going around giving out to players about their mobile phones and all that. that, that, that that's an old one. Now, that, that's all nonsense. It's as if you're going to work every day, it's scaring people. For, you know, you've played me. I, I certainly don't think I was that bad. Well, it's a twice, maybe. You know, I, yeah, yeah, but you have to put markers down with people. And, and, and Piquet said the same thing, but uh, I actually went over and we had a nice chat up in Celtic Park. You know, he didn't really mention that, you know. Mm. So, again, maybe he did, but the media just put out enough to say, you know, I'm some sort of, you know, people are scared of me. Did, did you like that, though, when you were playing? Did you like that reputation, I suppose, around you? Um, yeah, I didn't mind it because of the role I had in the team. Yeah, I didn't want to be pals with people and uh, and friendly. And even with my own teammates, I, I was always like that. But I think that's that's not a bad thing. Is I was never one for hugs and kisses before games and even afterwards. I like going to work. I like doing the business. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, you're, you're not all coming home with me in my head, or I'll be ringing you tonight, or we'd have a game of Xbox and all that nonsense. That was never my game, and it never will be. So if people expect me to change, they're talking nonsense. And even you run about what. I've learned from being a man, you know, a manager. People question my man managing skills. I actually thought I was okay. I thought, you know, I kept my distance from the players. I wasn't pals with them. Hopefully, I kept them on their toes. And I, I generally think if you speak to players who worked, you know, played a number of games under me, not lads I sold or kind of got rid of straight away, they're obviously going to say bad things. But lads who worked under me for a period of time, I generally think it's, you know, it's okay. I, I think I got that balance right. One of the probably the biggest things that does connect us, and probably something that I get reminded of, you'll get reminded even more of course was, was, was Saipan what would you do if you were on the other side now you're in management and coaching what would you do if you had a player challenging you in front of the in front of the team or having that sort of confrontation from the team how would but you I didn't challenge the manager how would you react to that situation I, did, I, I, I certainly wouldn't have accused a senior player or the captain of the team of fake an injury in front of a group of players that's what's happened, do you not remember? Well, I, I remember the, the incident, yeah. yeah. I remember the incident, yeah. yeah that, that's all. Uh, mm. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have challenged one of my senior players in front of a group of players saying, you're faking injury. I might have pulled him up to the side and go, listen, are you definitely injured? Are you all right? Or whatever it might be. So that was my issue with, with the World Cup. Or Mick, it wasn't no issue with the players. Yeah, obviously, we, we know there was disagreements about the facilities and the travelling, which was standard practice at the time with the FBI, which was frustrating. But for, 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 for a manager to accuse me of faking an injury is the biggest insult I could accept. And I said, I won't take it now. No chance. And, 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 and strangely enough, the, the players who were in the room at the time and the staff, they all went up and done their own little thing. Nobody came out and said exactly what happened. Ten years later, oh, Mick, Mick's a great guy, Mick's not. When people say what was said, tell the truth. They stood in front of everyone going, you could have played in a game, in the playoff game. I said, I couldn't, I was injured. You know I was injured. No, it's not true. And that's why he got it. I have no regrets about that. Absolutely none whatsoever. Do you, do you think, did you think about the, you know, about how it was going to go after that, the World Cup after the play? how they were going to go on did you ever have that bigger I picture I couldn't care less do you think the players were bothered about me that time a couple of lads come to my room the next morning 
and, and don't worry, I didn't expect 20 players to come up to the room and go, listen, Roy, sorry to see you leaving, because players, players live in their own little bubbles. Lads want to look after themselves. No problem with that. So if you think I went home and was like, eh, you know, worried about the players, do you think they were worried about me? Come on, let's get real. <laughs> Robbie, Robbie's going to be in the studio on Saturday, Robbie Savage, he's getting a lot of mileage out of the, oh, yeah, the message. Oh yeah, I'm sure he is. Have you got a message for Robbie? Really no, 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 I just, uh, people have, um, obviously I've been, I think I've been getting stick over it, but no, that, that was my managerial style, I just thought, you know, when he, his, um, his, his voicemail thing, I just thought, no, not for me, I swear. <laughs> Well, and I was wrong because I think he would have done well for us I think he would have done well for us but he obviously went to Derby and done well but no it's um, no, no big regrets about it you know I didn't think he was one that I don't think he's delighted you actually wanted to sign him I think that yeah no but we were desperate it. yeah we were desperate <laughs> <laughs> we were desperate I think we were getting him on a free no no I'm only joking no Robbie would have done alright for us no Robbie was a good player and a good personality and we needed that up in Sunderland and he would have done well for us um, but yeah no no we um, but that was part of my managerial style there. I just thought nah I need um, some serious characters but also to be fair you need characters like Robbie as well and to be fair he could play let's get back into obviously number two now how did that come about here then when you when you first decided to take that job on with Martin how did it come about uh, as usual a phone call Martin had, uh, Martin had heard on the grapevine that through the media that Martin mm. had a great chance of getting I think they asked me I was doing a, a gig down in Cork and I said, obviously, I think Martin's the ideal candidate. He's experienced, his personality. I'd met Martin once or twice, again, being a TV pundit. And um, so I thought, yeah, Martin looks like he's getting a job. And he called me before he took. He said, would you be interested in coming on board? I met him. And, you know, it's like, oh, pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Going, yeah, yeah, obviously there was contracts to discuss. And that was it. I just thought, yeah, perfect. Perfect. Let's go back at back back, back with it with Ireland because obviously I had my ups and downs with Ireland, but I, I never shied away from the fact how proud I was to be involved with Ireland. So when Martin said, "You fancy it, assistant?" I thought, "Yeah." D didn't blink an eye. I just said, "Yeah, let's go for it." And uh, no regrets. It's been great. Yeah. Do you think you've had to be a bit more restrained as a number two? Is that? Ah, yeah, of course. I, 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 I think strange when people saying, "Oh, what's going to be like to number?" I think the fact I'd been a manager would help me being a number two because I know how difficult it is. Yeah. And I have to know my boundaries with Martin, and hope a lot of that's come common sense and obviously there's other staff there I know my role hopefully Martin's taking my opinions on board about players or the training sessions um, so yeah I know my boundaries which I felt no problem mm. that, that's never been an issue for me even as a player people always felt when I was a captain at United I overstepped the mark and I tried to I, I don't think I ever did I thought yeah I know my role I know the responsibilities I know I'm not the manager and I, I'm the same as the assistant and, and I'm really enjoying it but I know deep down I, well, I do want to get back in the hot seat yeah I was going to say that, that's the thing that I mentioned I, I, I read in the book probably you said eventually you're going to, make, you're going to want to make them decisions it's the decision Definitely. making that oh. probably goes against you so when do you think you'll be I don't know it's, that's the million dollar yeah. question and obviously, I'd, uh, you know, we, we look at the Celtic situation over the summer yeah. and I thought it just wasn't the right time, it wasn't the right offer, it just the time it wasn't right. But I know deep down mm. that I, there will be hopefully come an opportunity that I can get back in and be the manager somewhere and, you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get mm. to it. Because I don't sit around hoping for managers to lose their job or, or keeping an eye on situations. No, no, I think if I get the call from somebody, I'll have a look at it. But at the moment, of course, mm. I've got two jobs. Obviously, with the Villa stuff as well, when that came up, I tell I'll go for that as well, back in the Premier day to day stuff you know get more coaching hours under my belt because when I was a manager I was maybe didn't do enough coaching I want to do more than that yeah. just, just around that say around that um, the villa thing so how have you found getting back into day to day then obviously different from this but when that opportunity came about, about did you just want to jump on that one straight away and get no, back no, into I, I probably sat back a little bit more on that because of the Irish situation and um, obviously spoke to when Paul I know one or two of his staff moved on towards the end of last season you know, I had the summer to think that one over. Um, obviously, spoke with Martin, spoke to the FEI, and we kind of came to the conclusion that, you know, yeah, I'll go for that as well. Obviously, it's all or nothing. You know, I don't work for two and a bit years. I end up having two jobs and writing mm. a book. So, it's how do the roles differ? How do the roles differ between the two? Do you think? Um, a good question I suppose that I suppose that with the international stuff we're only together for three or four days working with the other staff the day-to-day -day stuff is uh, yeah. a good question Kevin huh? you've caught me up that one no, I, don't. I suppose it's the same you're just trying to get a result when you get together obviously Villa walking day to day trying to win next Saturday international stuff we get together Tuesday mm. try and win on Saturday obviously look at keeping an eye on the, um, 
younger players coming through. There's a more responsibility as well with the FEI, get involved in the courses and um, underage teams, but ultimately for the senior team mm. to win. Um, you know, try and win every game you get involved in. Just, just one quick one on Man yeah. United. What do you think of, Man of Manchester United at the moment? You know, under Van Gaal, money that they spent, do you think they're on the right plat or the right setting now to go on and win the Premier League? Yeah, yeah, well, it's been a bit better the last few weeks from uh, clearly they're going to win lots of football matches because they've got lots of goals in their team now. As you said, going forward, the players have available. Amazing. But, you know, in terms of winning the bigger prize again, the Premiership and uh, Champions League and, and stuff like this, I think that might be a few years down the road yet, only in the sense that defensively they, they look to rebuild. You can win football matches, obviously, going forward win, with lots of goals, but mm. I think at the back, with the lack of experience and injury problems at the moment, um, it'll be very hard to win, to win titles.